Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the May 11th, 2010 school board meeting. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Do we have adjustments to the agenda? Uh, yes, we have uh, one piece that I brought this evening, which is you have been signing the forms that we have to have for the uh, town council when the vote comes. And so there is there is a motion that needs to go with that, and that is new. I think I gave you the wording to it, mm -hmm. so that when we get to that, we can manage that. That is the only thing that I know of that is new or changed. You do have, I'm assuming all of you have revised agendas. It says revised in the upper left-hand corner because there have been a couple of petitions that I think uh, have been sent to you by email. By email. If you don't have one, I'll no. I have some here. I don't. I don't. Okay, I need two to my left and one to my right. Two to my right. Okay, yep. So that will be item 7J. Okay. Um, also, Ellen, I do believe that... Um, we will be briefly addressing um, AP bio biology under yes. communications. That yes, that's right. G. Okay. Okay. Uh, minutes, school board minutes for the meeting Tuesday, April 13th, 2010. Do I have a motion? I move to accept the minutes as presented. Second. And a second. Okay, any um, questions or comments? Mary? Um, I, David, I, would, I was reading the budget section, um, and I noticed that um, only one board member um, was quoted, and, uh, let me put this down. and I'm not sure that, it, um, that it's not fully representative of um, how the evening went. Um, I happen to be reading some of the old budget books today, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> no. And um, I think it would be a good idea to go back and, and try and include some other comments from other board members on this um, to make it representative of the vote and some of the comments that were made that evening in support of um, the FY11 budget. Okay. okay. Could I also make a suggestion in that, on that same? I read paragraph three, and it was confusing to me and somewhat inconsistent with the yellow sheet that we got. Um, uh, I could name each little one, but like, for example, it was always rounded up, whereas on the yellow sheet, it was not rounded up. Um, they used net to taxes was 3.5, and I thought the net to taxes is really expressed normally as 1.7. So I, I just thought it was a bit confusing because when I read this and compared it to the yellow sheet that we got, there was inconsistencies and I thought they should be made consistent. And you said that's a paragraph three, is that correct? Paragraph three, it's got all the information there, but for, I'll give you the, the example. I mean, it uses 3.4% increase and it's actually, um, it's gonna be hard for me to trace it. I'll give you the sentence that that um, um, the resulting tax rate for the house from, would move from 12, et cetera, et cetera, uh, a 0 0.35 thousand or 2.8, it's actually 2.75. I mean, I know whether you round it up or not, but the most important one is um, it said net taxes increase um, would be uh, a 3.5. My understanding of net tax increases would be it would be 1.7 assuming the town stayed the same so I, I think that word net the taxes should have been according to the yellow sheet um, um, okay uh, three point David if I may the 3.4 percent number that you're reading in paragraph three actually refers to the expenditure increase it says the school department expenditures would be I'm reading the next sentence 
or a 3.4% increase. I'm reading the next sentence. Okay. So then net to taxes would be $17 million or a 3.5% increase. And if you look at the yellow, yellow. So you would like, Pauline, to just double check that number to make sure. Well, I really right. think if you use net to taxes the way we all normally do, it would be 1.7 rather than. That's uh, later down. That's later down. That's later down. That's why it got confusing to me because it says net to taxes up there. That actually is not a net to tax number. The 584 is 3.49 on the yellow sheet, and that's total property tax revenues. So it's just a little bit jumbled up. I just would ask that it. Pauline, do you want to say something? The 3.5% increase is net to taxes for education, and then the last uh, sentence in that paragraph um, tells us that the town tax rate would be a 1.7% increase. And my, my point is, I think most people think net, first of all, it doesn't say net to taxes for just education. Most people think net to taxes, whether it's right or not, is what the tax rate increase they'll actually have to pay for their house. And to me, if you assume the town budget zero, the net to tax word should be put to the last sentence. And the 3.5 is really the total property tax revenues increase for the school. <coughs> that would be my suggestion. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll figure it. something out. Okay, um, all right, so do we want to table this vote until the changes are made? I, I had some other Have changes. Would you be willing to do that? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Can, Hold on, David. Okay, so that, is that okay for you with the, your comments on, on that section? Yes. Okay, David, do you have other? Um, I have other, and I, if we're going to table that, I just assume write mine and save us time. Right and write my changes, because I had a little bit of Mary's problem. I thought some things were left out that I thought were very important to be left in. And, you know, everybody has their own way of shortening it. And so I, would, I had some suggested paragraphs to put in. I don't think the rest of it's wrong. I just think that there's some fill that should be put in there. That important fill. Why don't you go ahead and write that up and share it with the board? Okay. okay. I'd, be, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, so um, there's, uh, I guess we need to motion to, no, motion to table it. Sure. I move that we table um, the meeting minutes from Tuesday, April uh, 13th, 2010. <laughs> Second. Okay. All those in favor of tabling? Okay. All right. Minutes for the special meeting, two th uh, April 27th, 2010. We have a motion. Somebody, please, motion. <coughs> I move that we approve the minutes from the special meeting of Tuesday, April 27th, as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Kathy, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments about the minutes? Okay, all those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Okay, comments by student representative? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um. Busy month for the high school. Two weeks ago, juniors took SATs, which were SATs. Um, <laughs> not much to say about it in a good way. Um, last week and this week are AP tests for all students involved, so class is definitely <laughs> broken up somewhat. But this Saturday, everyone will be hopefully rewarded with prom, so everyone's looking forward to that. And then Tuesday after, we lose the class of 2010. So, um, mixed emotions, I guess. Uh, in terms of sports, spring season's full swing by now. Playoffs start in a couple weeks, so um, hopefully successful postseason. And then just in terms of what the SAC is doing, um, the committees we broke into earlier this year really starting to make progress. I know in terms of the extracurricular committee, the program's moving forward and will hopefully be in place for next year. And then elections for SAC for next year occur at the end of the month and beginning of June. Could, could you explain what SAC means? For uh, it's just the Cape High School's version of student government. So. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Uh, I just mentioned that um, our middle school representatives are all engaged in extracurricular activities this evening, so they were unable to uh, join us. Okay, comments from public on agenda items? Okay. All right, starting with recognition, we have our Palm Cove principal for a day. Mr. Lee, would you like to come up and speak to us? Best dressed principal we've had in quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> One of the tallest, too. You, you don't have to, they got you on TV. You don't have to just become a Hello, I'm Ms. Lee, and I was the principal for the day today. What grade are you in, Aiden? Second grade. I started my day by greeting people coming to school from the bus. I did the announcements and a joke. I visited classes and met a lot of people. I gave people ID stickers if they didn't have their ID badges. <laughs> the kids liked the rule changes. That they could chew gum, they could wear hats. I allowed small electronic devices. I allowed people to wear PJs. And they got longer recesses and no homework. My day was really good going around to almost all the classes. I, I did, I, um, uh, <laughs> I didn't miss some classes, though. Thank you. Your principal, Mr. Lee. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. He has until about midnight to do placement and budget. <laughs> he was also asked, how many people asked you for raises today? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Did you... Did you say yes to mm, No. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. Like them. Next them. time to your own teachers, say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I have to say, Aiden, Aiden did a great job. He came early and stayed late. He was very conscious about the clock. He managed to change into recess clothes and PE clothes. And uh, he had his own email. He was answering emails all day. It was pretty hard, part of it, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 And he was very popular. Very, very popular. <laughs> Any questions for our principal? I actually have one comment. I was told by my uh, Pond Cove um, stepdaughter that um, you did a great job and that you were going to be showing up today. And uh, that was to look forward to your speech. And I want to tell you you did a great job, and I'll, I'll tell her that you did. Thanks. I have a question. All right, did you have a question? Just, Nadine, I just wanted to tell you that um, we spend a whole year on meetings, and we do a lot of things that aren't as much fun except for this. This is my favorite part of the whole year is the Pond Cove principal for the day, and you did a great job. Thanks. Um, I'll ask the question that I asked last year. Do you think you want to be a principal when you grow up? Yes. <laughs> well, if he gets that kind of power, he will. <laughs> Same rate of pay, though. Right? <laughs> Not adjusted for inflation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Next is Pond Cove Middle School Arts Night. The fourth annual Arts Night at Cape Elizabeth Middle School and Pond Cove was a huge success with a strong turnout of students, parents, and community members. Artwork from every student was represented in the hallways at the middle school. Under the direction of Terry White, we heard the music of the jazz, the jazz combo and individual music performances. Other events were students reciting poetry, Becky Bean leading a group of students in drumming, African drumming, the unveiling of a seat-sponsored mural in the teacher's room, if you haven't had an opportunity to check that room out, right now it's typically been just four walls and some tables in there. Now there's a tremendous uh, view of Fort Williams. Um, student Art Bazaar held along the hallway outside the cafeteria. Also the main College of Art students were creating hands-on art in the art room. Middle school students' artwork and sculpture was on display and there was a, there was a raffle 
opportunity there that uh, was won by Andrew Thomas. Many thanks to our talented middle school musicians and artists, Marguerite Lala Rohner, Becky Bean, Terry White, the Arts Night Committee Chairs Suzanne McGinn and Lisa Gent, the MSPA, C, the Maine College of Art students, and all the parents, students, and community members who made this Arts Night possible. Tom, did you have anything on Arts Night for the Tonko? I think uh, the whole community appreciated having both buildings lit up that night. Uh, it was a little lower key at Pond Cove, but we did have a music concert at the same time. And if you haven't visited Pond Cove recently, it's still rather decked out. It's really spectacular. <coughs> Great thing to do with the middle school, too. Thank you. Does anybody have any uh, questions or comments? I'll just say that I attended, and um, it was a fabulous night. and. Um, the result of a lot of work by many, many individuals. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of um, everybody's effort. And that mural is absolutely spectacular and transforms a rather dreary conference room into a lovely space. So it's wonderful. David? I had a quick question of Steve, and it's not on the agenda. Um, but I, I wanted to ask him, if I may. He can, I'm just curious as to how well middle school sports have been going, because is that, am I? Allowed to ask him that question? Um, not at the moment. If we have time, maybe we okay. can do that. But we do have a set agenda. It's something he and I worked on last year, and he had some good ideas, and I wanted to see how we thought it was going. Well, maybe we can actually. Okay. I think it'd be, to be fair to Steve, that if he had advance notice, so maybe in our, our next meeting we could ask him that. But let's just see how the evening goes, and if we have time and he's up to a answering, that we can do that. Okay, moving on to Teacher Appreciation Week. That's me. Um, so I'm sure everybody's aware uh, that um, this week is teacher, last, last, last week. week, last week was teacher appreciation week. That's what I thought, but then the middle school still has some teacher appreciation activities planned, so I got a little worried that I was <laughs> premature in my, my email. But um, I did want to share um, at our meeting um, a, a note that I sent to the teachers um, last Friday. Uh, and I'll just take a moment to read if that's okay. Um, so when I first ran for the school board, my children, believe it or not, were four years old and in preschool. I knew very little of our teachers here in Cape Elizabeth or of their daily work. And over the past six years, it has been my honor to listen to them describe their many achievements inside and outside the classrooms, the eavesdrop on their impassioned arguments over such things as curriculum, and to personally experience their artistry with my own children who are now in middle school. As a board member, I have spent a lot of time debating policy, procedure, and finances, and it can be easy to lose sight of our basic objective to help our students become successful individuals and citizens. Luckily, all it takes is listening to the wonderful updates from our student representatives, hearing good news and accomplishments from our teachers, attending arts night, band concerts, open houses, theater performances, or reading the high school's The View. And I am reminded why our teachers are such a valuable resource to our community. Over the years, I am constantly struck by the poise, intelligence, maturity, talent, and passion of our young people, and by the dedication, passion, patience, and endurance of our teachers who guide them. In this day of data-driven decision-making, our teachers know that much of, what they can, or much of what they do cannot be captured in numbers and graphs. While mindful of the curriculum that they must cover to meet testing requirements, our teachers endeavor to meet the whole child, inspire curiosity, and encourage discovery, ultimately to create lifelong learners. So in the spirit of Teacher Appreciation Week, I want to thank our teachers on behalf of the board, parents, and town citizens for showing up each day for our children, sustaining a positive outlook, finding never-ending ways to inspire, for encouraging questions that maybe they can't answer, for finding those moments for humor, for never giving up, and for choosing a profession that, while challenging, has the potential to leave lifetimes of legacies in a generation of productive and engaged citizens. So my sincerest thanks to all of our, our teachers. Okay, moving on to Project Citizen. Mr. Conley, would there, would, are there people from Project Citizen coming? Okay, all right. 
Apparently we don't have them. Okay. Well, would we like to briefly describe Project Citizen and what it was about? And So last year in the eighth grade, a couple of social studies teachers decided to take on the uh, project of uh, the, the work of Project Citizen, which is a, an initiative about um, teaching students how public policy works, what the, the legal process is for that, how that plays an important role in a democratic society, um, how that leads uh, citizenry to be in, involved in roles, procedures that you have to go through. And uh, this year we had all of our seventh grade, uh, eighth graders, we used to do a, a, uh, an eye search project and we decided that instead it would move to the um, Project Citizen piece for all students. So they were in groups, um, some of the groups varied typically around four or five students per group and they had, um, uh, the, the pieces that they had to do were first of all come up with topics that other people might be interested in, so there were lots of surveys that occurred. Um, several groups interviewed me early on about things like um, uh, personal electronic devices being allowed in school settings, about um, uh, personal electronic devices being used, that seemed to be a popular theme this year, about being uh, used while driving a vehicle, distracted drivers. Uh, there were things about, give me some help with some other topics. Oh, about trash. About uh, composting. Yep. Yep, recycling. So the, the range of topics that students chose was, was very diverse. It was an interesting group. Uh, students spent a good deal of time working in their groups to uh, develop their, uh, they had to come up with uh, primary sources to, in their research. They developed a uh, notebook that contained evidence of all their searches that they had found so they could back up the information that they used to then make their decision. They had to make a, a problem statement out of this and then what they would like to see happen because of that, the public policy change that they would like to see take place. So um, the, the notebooks were really four inches thick. Um, they were post displays by all the different groups. We had an evening where those were displayed in the cafeteria. Um, there were, uh, there was in the, a... In that, at that event, seven chosen by the teachers, seven of the top groups actually presented their, their pieces. Uh, I just wanted, to, I wanted to, to mention that Evan Solander has been key in really um, making this happen at, at the middle school. And he worked with a, a teacher at uh, Lyman Moore Middle School in Portland who had been doing it for years. And, and borrowed a lot of, of those ideas from him um, and <coughs> did it with just his classes last year. And then this year, the whole eighth grade took it on. And, and it was so impressive to walk around the cafeteria the night that they did their thing and see all those colorful displays. But the real meat of the work is in these binders. Um, this week, they went to Augusta mm -hmm. and oh, presented uh, four three teams, groups, I think. We were just going to bring two, and then kids. another school bailed, and, yeah, and they went. Um, and we're actually able to present to legislature or at least to members of, of some committees in Augusta. And they competed sort of against some other schools. Last year um, in Evan's group, uh, you mentioned he worked with a teacher from Lyman Moore, a guy named Glenn Nurback, who's on loan from uh, Portland schools to the Department of Education, uh, who had done this for a number of years. So he was able to show the ropes of this project to Evan and then he's done the train the trainer model with the rest of our staff and they uh, they actually last year one of the projects from Evans class won the was chosen elected to represent the state uh, at the uh, in the capital for um, uh, I think it was to a, a regional or a national competition yeah, it went to, to Washington went, and it ended up in Washington DC and right. we later heard that they won uh, outstanding merit for their work in that and received a, an honorary uh, um, uh, trophy. And then this year, our groups that are, uh, our projects that are at the Capitol, we uh, hope to hear from them about the, the quality of that work as well. So we do get feedback on the pieces. Thank you. It's, it's a great project. It's just sort of so, it's relevant and it really brings home some of the, the current issues to the kids. I would, I would just speak to it quickly. I went the other night as they presented. Uh, not only is there, were the displays excellent, their notebooks, 
but I have to speak, I have to talk about the way they spoke. They knew what they were talking about. They gave a very clear, concise uh, explanation of every piece of the puzzle. And they were, it was just extremely impressive to watch eighth graders be able to do that with such confidence uh, in that process. It was, it was a, an, an amazing evening to be there. So I really, uh, it's, it's a great exercise in citizenship. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Payton. Okay. Uh, next is the high school government students candidate debates. I will say, start off by saying this, that some of you know Ted Jordan, uh, who's been a teacher at the high school for 10 years, Dwight, 12 years, something like that, somewhere in the vicinity of that. He is an absolute gift to the school and a gift to his students who benefit from his teaching. And the thing that, that excites Ted's passion more than anything else is bringing the community into the school or bringing, bringing the students out into the community. Um, and so this was really just uh, one, more, one more thing that he does, and I have to say that it takes an awful lot of work to organize. Um, he was emailing all the leading Democratic and Republican candidates. He and I spoke, and we've gone, gone over these things before, and he, he is absolutely even-handed in the way he presents things. Um, the way the logistics worked out, um, my recollection is I was only at one of the evenings that the the candidates had to be separated. He, the original plan was having them all together, but just because of their availability and things, so there became a, a Democratic evening and a, a Republican evening. Or was the was one of them during the daytime? The two, two different evenings. The daytime. I thought I thought I thought one was the school assembly. Um, students came from Ted's classes um, and from other other social studies classes as well. Um, the kids get the opportunity to lead, to moderate those discussions, to ask questions, to ask follow-up questions. I think it's just a great opportunity, and um, it, was, it was really, very cool. And I, I would speak to it very quickly, too. I did not get to one of the two. I won't name which one I couldn't go to, so it won't look like it's political. Uh, but what I was really struck by, and I'm always struck by by Cape Elizabeth, is the students who come in to see the, the debate itself and how polite they are and how carefully they listen. That doesn't happen everywhere. And I think it's a really important point to make that as the candidates spoke, they listened carefully and were very uh, appreciative of what was going on. I was, I was quite impressed with that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. OK, moving on to communications. Yes. Uh, Alan. I do have two resignations this evening. To let you know about the first one is from Cindy Perkins, who has been the school counselor and or social worker at Pond Cove. Uh, her simple letter was, I'm writing to inform you of my resignation as school counselor at Pond Cove, effective mm -hmm. at the end of the current contract year 2009-2010. The second letter is from Sarah Harrington, who teaches social studies at the high school. Uh, I do want to comment on this letter because I thought it was quite interesting, is that uh, Sarah is resigning uh, effective August 30th as our, as our way, meaning her, she and her husband, of dealing with the difficult economic conditions. Uh, her husband, who is completing the extended teacher education program at the University of Southern Maine, and I have decided to take a position in the American International School in Lesotho, Africa, beginning with the 2010-2011 school year. She writes to thank uh, the school system for the opportunities that she's had here, and she did make a comment that should my career path lead me back toward Maine in the future, I hope that I might be able to look for open opportunities in Cape Elizabeth. It's a wonderful place to teach and to learn. And uh, then she offered any assistance she could in the transition. So those are the two resignations that I have. Great. <clears throat> Next is um, the Seaf Spring Grant Cycle. And we do have a representative from Seaf, Claire Dempsey. Well, I'm pleased to say we funded over $27,000 of grants this spring cycle. Um, we were inundated with requests, as always. I think we were asked for over 147000 in grants at one point. Um, deliberations, as always, were long and well thought out. And I think we came up with a pretty good slate at the end of it. I'm not sure. I haven't presented 
this part before, so I don't know if you want me to go through every line item or just give you a brief, ta brief taste of what we did, every line item. A brief taste would be good, and I believe that this information will come to the board as to what was approved. And yeah. So there was a fair amount of um, professional development, which we didn't fund everything that came before us, but um, we have funded a couple here in particular I'll draw attention to was Gwyneth McGuire from the middle school to go to a conference and exposition ISTE and we felt that that was addressing a need with the technology and the laptops that the seventh and eighth graders have. Um, she would help students create digital portfolios which obviously is a good use in the high school but to teach them while they're in middle school and perhaps more receptive to learning these, these new things we thought was a good idea and she will learn um, I think it's in Denver, but she will then relate anything she learns to the high school technician as well to further that knowledge. Um, Susan Dana is going on a fantastic Spanish um, language and culture course in Spain. She is funding a large portion of it herself and had looked for alternative sources and did a wonderful job of, I felt like I wanted to go in her suitcase. She's definitely going to do some wonderful things and bring it back to our students here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, Tom Lazot, who I see here tonight, is putting together um, a fantastic symphony um, to bring an interna internationally known composer, Andrew Boysen, to compose music for um, the Wind Symphony. And I think it's going to focus on the lives of four key significant people in Cape Elizabeth. So, uh, Sifa, pleased to partially fund that with Tom. Um, we have some more technology for Pond Cove. Uh, we only funded a partial part of that in our, we feel like we have now really seeded this technology and Tom and the staff of Pond Cove have embraced it. We've now been largely responsible for with the PCPA of putting smart board um, and related technology into all the first and second grade classrooms and now all classrooms have some form of technology, whether it's a projector or a smart board or something else. And it was interesting to note with Gary Illinois that um, you know, of the, I think, 48 items that have been in Pond Cove, I think 30, 37 of them have been funded through parent organizations like CIF and the PCPA. And CIF are really behind this, but really looking forward to the district taking up the mantle, really, um, and seeing that move forward. Um, what else? Do you have any questions for me in particular? All of these are listed on the website. Um, Mary and I have met and spoken. She has a detailed list of what we funded and what we did not fund. Um, as always, there are stories that break your heart, but in addition to not funding things that don't fall within the school budget, we also have a pretty strong mission to fund things that are innovative and excellent, either affecting a large group or a profound influence upon a very small group. And it was definitely, you could see more and more of the budget crunches coming to us, and, uh, and we had some tough decisions to make. But. Does the board have any questions for Claire? I would just say this is my fifth year in Cape Elizabeth and have worked with SEEF since I came and I would like to say publicly as I have said behind closed doors when we've met to thank you for the enormous work you're doing. What is very nice about it as we go through these difficult times and look at cuts etc. What SEEF does for the classrooms you walk around and you see big smiles on everyone's face because of what you were able to do. And uh, I recognize the hard work you had with $147,000 worth of requests, but I think you did an excellent job looking at each one of them and funding them accordingly. So I thank you uh, f from my perspective because of all the work that is done and what it does to help the students in Cape Elizabeth get a solid education. Thank you. And I would just add that um, I would thank, please pass on my thanks to all of your volunteers. Um, I know there's just countless amount of hours that go into keeping CIF up and running and generating um, donations and then going through the grant process and um, I really appreciate all the time and effort that everybody puts into it. Not quite as many hours as the school board. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I also would like to express my appreciation to CEEF disclosure. I am a member of CEEF, but um, um, I think it is wonderful that a town like this has an organization like CEEF who's dedicated and does as much work as it does. Um, regrettably, we really need you as much as we need you, and, uh, but thank you very much for everything you've done. Thank you. Thanks thank for coming tonight. Thank you. I might mention she, I was also a curious judge, same day I was this weekend, and <laughs> so it was an interesting day. <laughs> okay, all right, next is the state of our schools, Alan. Yes, uh, I, I, just to mention briefly, uh, about a month and a half ago we received a report called School Achievement and Progress List, which I think was sent to all of you at the time, which shows every public school in Maine, middle, uh, elementary, middle, and high school. And the state's uh, report about this is showing the growth that has occurred. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. What I would say to you is this. Uh, I was very pleased to look at all three of our schools and see, number one, the percentage of increase that they've shown in their work. Uh, and that uh, we are, if you look at our scores in comparison to other scores, we score at a very high level. And uh, we see that Pond Cove scored at a 1.97% increase, uh, which is an important increase. Uh, we also saw that Cape High School was at a 2.08 increase, and Cape Elizabeth Middle School was at the highest at 5.53. And I think that's very important information for you to have as we look at it. My understanding from my secretary is this has been sent to you several weeks ago. If you don't have copies, if you let me know, I will get copies for you. But even more importantly tonight, what I did was ask all three principals if they could give a fairly brief report about where they see the uh, data as far as our state testing and how it is reflected in our schools. And so I think Tom is going to start with Pond Cove. Can I make a request, Tom? Uh, I'm still catching up on the acronym, so when you explain. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder. I, I, if I forget, David, just remind me. Wow. Thanks, Alan. That, that's a good introduction. And since I'm going first, uh, one of my responsibilities is to give you a little technical background. You have some graphs in your packets already from the New England Common Assessment Project, NECAP. That's the acronym for that, from Pond Cove in the middle school. And it's the old SAT you're familiar with, I think, from the high school that have our levels of achievements and comparisons with area schools. But as I said, I want to give you a little technical background of how these scores were generated. This is the first year that Maine has administered the NECAP as part of the federal No Child Left Behind laws, which began probably 10 years ago. Prior to that, we used the Maine Educational Assessment, the MEA. A change in state law that previously required administration of the MEA in March allowed Maine to join with New Hampshire, Vermont, and Rhode Island to use the NECAP in the fall. This saved uh, the state and the taxpayers about a million dollars. And the fall schedule, we did the NECAPs in the fall, meant that we got the results back over the winter. The old MEA we had to take in March, and that meant we didn't get the results back into summer, which made them a little late because the class, uh, classes had moved on. The content in the NECAP, the, um, which is shared by the state, is very well matched to Maine's, though on a finer grain level we've had to do something, um, we have to do more work in the grade level expectations, the GLEs in reading and math. That's about all the acronyms for a while. I should say, incidentally, it's the same vendor that had the MEA, it also, also produces the NECAP, so they're not losing any money over that. But back to the scores, um, I'll be on the MEA for a little while because the, the results that Alan mentioned were based on the MEA. I was disappointed but not surprised when the March 2009 MEA results showed that Pond Cove did not meet the standard for annual yearly project, AYP, in one subcategory. The school as a whole exceeded the standards easily for attendance and overall achievement, but we did not show enough progress in the subcategory of students with individual education pro uh, programs, IEPs, or special education in mathematics. In case you don't know, uh, the bar for, for the school and all the sub subcategories keeps rising, and it's just a matter of time before every school in the nation actually is on this list. Uh, I'm not sure what Congress is going to do with No Child Left Behind, but it's 
arithmetically demonstrable, it will all be on the list. So our time has come. I said I'm disappointed but not surprised, but I've consulted with Dominic and he has responded with his team and our student support team is also taking that seriously. Now I have to switch back to the kneecap because the latest uh, AYP declarations came from Augusta and we are potentially on the list again. But we are also, we could be spared that through a calculation known as safe harbor. Are you following all this, David? No. <laughs> which gives credit for schools that don't reach the bar but are making substantial progress. I, I quickly did my calculations and I think we'd be, we'll be off the list, but I won't know for sure um, for a few more weeks. I'm not sure when we hear Alan. But uh, be that as it may, it's, it's, it's still a reminder that we have more work to do with those kids. Um, the, the list that Alan produced, the, uh, that was the attempt by the Maine Department of Education to find the lowest schools in the state of course, Pond Cove and the other two schools were nowhere near, that, nowhere near that level, but the results, as Alan said, were interesting. We're consistently very high. We, there's a, we had a slight dip in Pond Cove last year. We started out um, combining scores of kids who meet or exceed the standards was about 84%. 82% uh, went up to 84, then it went down. We average it out, we have a slight dip, but it's very consistently high. It, it just by using that metric, if you look in that list, you'll see um, Pond Cove Middle School and High School bunched together by that metric right near the top. And it's, it, to me, that's a model of consistency to see the three schools above 80%, 82%, 83% with kids meeting the standard. It's, it's a crude way to look, about it, but I look at it, but I'll explain how we get uh, more specific information in a minute. Another benefit of NECAP is that Although it's only the kids in grades three and four who take the exam, it, it is based on the standards for the previous grade. So when the Pond Cove results come in, I can see the mastery level for grades two, three, and four. The scores that, we, uh, that the fifth graders get reflect their achievement level in grade four, and they were really, really high. Whether it's a bump or a trend, I don't know, but it was up in the, uh, the high 80% uh, toward 90 in both reading and math for me, uh, meeting or exceeding. Again, it's all well and good as a source for pride, but even Augusta cautions us against using one measure to make uh, significant decisions about students or schools. The kneecap, for example, is considered to be an on-demand test. The kids have a certain amount of time to respond, and it's a check about skills that can be done on, uh, on demand. So the format doesn't include um, assessments of deeper, perhaps more meaningful, co uh, sustained competencies like fluency and accuracy in reading. And as part of our district work, it's to develop local assessments, not the old LAS, but local assessments that would uh, deepen our understanding where kids are. Um, our developmental reading assessment, the DRA, is one of the ways we're doing that. It's not on the state list, but it matches up our curriculum. And we're working on others. We're planning to do work this summer in math and writing to get that done. As for comparing with other schools, it's, I find it interesting, but I don't look at it as a competition. It's, to me, it's a chance to learn from schools who might have had more su success and we can share it with them, and particularly how to target assistance to those students who are not meeting the standards. A good example is a, a team went up to Falmouth late winter, early spring, and uh, were very well hosted by Falmouth and brought back information that has our student support team comparing their support system with ours. And we're also looking at um, Yarmouth, Cumberland, and our um, partner school in Wayland, Massachusetts. What do we do internally? Well, the, the NECAP has some very interesting features on the website. Besa besides raw scores and averages, it provides us with disaggregations by gender and by class and by student. And it has an item analysis, so we know exactly how kids did on particular items and whether there was a particular wrong answer. In addition, the tech department takes all this information and puts it on PowerSchool so it's accessible to me and the teachers for, for use with kids. I've mentioned the um, student support team, the SST, they're really responsible for a lot of curriculum instruction and assessment, and they've become the nexus for interpreting all the scores. The, this team does a preliminary screening, the information goes to the whole faculty, then it goes to teaching teams and it gets more fine grained as it gets out there. We know who the struggling students are 
And most, if not all of them, have personal plans, either through SST or through instructional support. And one more example, to get even more specific, because we're concerned what happens before grades two and three, the teacher leader and the literacy team have come up with an assessment tracking wall to, to show kids graphically, kids who have not met the benchmark in grade one in reading by January. So we have a card for each one of them, and when we meet on Thursdays, we see how they're doing each week. The code, code card is very dramatic and visual, and we know who those kids are. Because this information is so important for the curriculum reports we've been doing, I hope I've given you some idea how we're proceeding and how useful this could be at the classroom level. Does anyone have any questions specifically for Panko? <clears throat> if you can um, hold off on some of your broader scope questions, if you have any, on the um, process of assessment analysis and things like that. So if it's specific to Panko, feel free. Otherwise, wait until we hear from the other schools. Thank you. Anybody? I was still thinking. Okay, well. I'm trying to figure out the distinction between Panko versus all schools. It would help me a little bit. We only have this chart. I see things on the side. I have no idea what PD, P, PP, SB is, and how to interpret these charts. And I, I, just a yeah. general explanation of what the charts we receive would be would help me follow all three schools. Yep. Can you help? Which, which one would you like to start with? Well, I, I have for Pond Cove, I have, uh, it looks like <coughs> six pages of graph. I see you have that. Yeah. So I think, Tom, if you could just help um, define for us what PD, P, PP, and SP is. In the very first shot. Um, because that's continued with through all, all. I think. Proficient with the, the right from NECAP. Proficient with distinction. Proficient, correct me if I'm wrong. Partially proficient and substantially below proficient. Yeah. It's that orange segment we are particularly concerned about. And so proficient S with distinction. Yeah. Proficient. Proficient. Partially, partially proficient. proficient. Substantially, and substantially below. below proficient. Okay, does anybody have any other questions about Panko? Hey, Tom. Um, what I wonder is there must be conversations about how we're going to solve this problem of eventually when we're all going to be on the safe harbor list. Yeah. And how the test is um, given so that there's, they make the statements, but also there's a, a number rate that um, <clears throat> who talks about, who gets to discuss the testing? Is it like the DRA is a, that comes from uh, that's, that's a commercial assessment that we use. We, we bought the protocol for it, and we do that. It, and your question was, who gets to discuss this? Well, is it the... It's federally mandated. It's federally mandated. AYP is a federally mandated assessment. So... Uh, for character, uh, for evaluation of a district. Right. So the whole United States. So... Yeah. Um, yeah. Without getting too deeply into it, though, all the state standards are different. Right, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. The, so who decides it, it, the state it did, standards? It did pay in the beginning, 10 years ago, to have really right. low standards. Right. And you, and you can show progress. Going up. We, we didn't play that game. Okay. There is a, a movement afoot, however, under the Obama administration to create a national standard. And that is the whole, I believe, purpose of Race to the Top. Yep. Because in order for you to receive those funds, you have to adopt the core standards that they had developed on a national basis. So there is an attempt to um, create a consistency between states through yeah. this, through this and program. It's, it's an interesting clash between federal money and state control of education. Right. So th this, this will play out over time. Money, money may talk, though. I, I can't wait to read the, um, how they do it. I, I'd love to read the booklet, so I'll look up yeah. the booklet and read it yeah. to understand that. Thank you. Can I have one more explanation of the, if you could explain the last four graphs, which were somewhat of comparison, and now I want to understand what the acronym means. The lines? Yeah, the, the lines the, in its... It, it's not over time, it, it's just two separate grade levels, and the, the scores are connected with a line. It's That's the grade same three and grade school. four. It, it right. looks like a growth chart, but it's not. It's, it's um... 
So it's really showing us as, as a as a. Somebody help me. Uh, You're comparing uh, to other districts. Actually, yeah. it's comparing it to just the state until the last page. Right. I'm trying to think of the right word. Uh, um, control group will right. use the state, right. and then the last page. Right. So I, I can follow this, and then I look at the last page, last two pages. Excuse me. Is there? Obviously, I don't know how much of a difference it means between 48 to 51. I don't. If with 52 to the top, I mean, I can make a graph look horrible or great, depending on what I do. Can, is there a way you can interpret us versus the state and versus we're, primary competitors? We're, we're significantly above the state in the meets or exceeds, and we kind of float around with, uh, with our comparable districts. The, the most, what does, this does though, David, it disguises the other parts because it doesn't disaggregate at all. So you could have a three. Disaggregate at all? It, yeah. We, you don't know what the subcategories are. How many kids in, are in which category? So it's an average number in that way. It's pretty crude. So you'd have to look at the next level, which would be how many with distinction, how many proficient, and so on. So if, if for example, we had a, a large percentage does this include instructional support children yep. as well? Yeah, everybody. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, since I'm, we're just asking, is there anything you think of significance in this that, that we should know? I mean, consistently, I think it's Falmouth and Yarmouth, at least in these charts, I've, my, my, my contacts are not great, but seem to do slightly better, yep. but I don't know whether what three points is really statistically significant or not. Yes, for it, one it, year. It can be, yeah. It can be? It can be, but I think the significant part is, is, is the, um, the strength from K through 12. There's not a lot of difference, and there's actually some improvement in some areas as the kids get older. From my perspective, that would mean that we identify kids early, give them help, and by the time they get older, they're getting the help they need. It, t it takes a while to catch up, but they do catch up. The other significant part is we know who every kid is who is below or significantly below, and they have a plan. John, any other questions? Okay. All right. Sorry, a little longer. Thank you. That, that, that Tom, also, thank you for giving the background of the testing. Yeah, so you don't have to do that. Part. That's great. That's great because <laughs> since you did that, that and given all the acronyms and mnemonic devices and all these other things, what that means is that these folks should understand that when we look at a, the AYP, we're trying to figure out on the GLEs and the MLRs how we do towards our CBMs, the NECAPs, the NWEAs, the MEAs, whether we're P, PP, PD, or or SP, and we have to do that ASAP because the NCLBs require us to establish, to go back to the SST, figure out a PLP or an SLP for RTI for those kids. How many times did you okay. practice that? Yeah. A couple. I, I have an acronym for it, but I think, <laughs> you figure out, I think people would figure out what Save it was. Now, yeah. <laughs> How many letters in that acronym? Uh, let's see. And uh, you'll be glad to know that our Triple C partners are in uh, the same situation. So, um, as a matter of fact, I talked with. Uh, uh, the principal at Falmouth Greeley and, and uh, Frank Harrison schools and um, <coughs> Greeley is the only one of our group that this year made both a AYP in both reading and math. Uh, Falmouth is going to make it based on a thing that, that is their uh, their uh, scoring bands. They're, they're going to make it based on their plus or minus range. And then there's Falmouth, uh, uh, no, excuse me, uh, Yarmouth. Yarmouth. Yarmouth, who made it in reading but missed it, is, is pending safe harbor in math. We are currently not, uh, we didn't make it in reading, and we're pending safe harbor in math. So um, this is a really strange thing to get. You take a school in which if you do the, the information that Alan spoke about a little while ago was saying that um, over the past three years, the percentile report that's on the state website indicates that the middle school students uh, have made progress at the rate of 5.5%, which is the, the highest score out of any of the comparative districts. And we have 86.5% of our students who meet or exceed the standards in anything. 
So maybe, maybe they meet it in the math, maybe they meet it in the reading, maybe they meet it in both. And yet we can, I can get a report from the State Department that says your school doesn't meet AYP. Um, that is a really bizarre thing that, that's tough to uh, reconcile. Other things that are very difficult to reconcile in this particular testing situation for administrators in the state is the fact that um, this is comparing the previous MEAs as your baseline data to determine growth on the kneecaps. And when the state looks at it and says that those things are, are very comparable scores, I'm very clear if you look at our scores and trends that they're not. Because, in, um, for instance, our math scores have always been six, seven, eight, nine points higher than our uh, reading scores throughout the history of our, in, uh, our MEAs. On the kneecaps, we're six, seven, eight, nine points higher in reading than math across the board. It's exactly the reverse. And the kneecaps aren't talking about something we've done this year because they were taken in October to refer to last year. Mm -hmm. So. They took the MEAs from March, and then they took the kneecaps in October and said, we'll give you April, May, June, July, August, and September to demonstrate a year's worth of progress with those kids. Well, how, how could we miss? So it's, it's really one of those things that if I scratch my head anymore, I'll have another bald spot, but that's the way it goes. Um, I also did check, our, we missed it uh, based on our identified disability subgroup. Believe it or not, the state number, the percentage that's been picked for um, determining whether you have made AYP, if 66% of your students with, with disabilities that have IEPs meet the standard or exceed it, then you're good. If two-thirds of any group of students with disabilities made it, why would you have a group with two-thirds? Why would you have a group constructed like that? Where would that possibly come from? So I spoke with uh, Rochelle Tome from the state to ask her that question. And she said, well, back a few years ago when we started the NCLB, we selected a number. And that percentage that we said, every year you must demonstrate that you're raising the bar. So now we're at 66%. We really wish we'd started lower to begin with. It's great, love it. In math, you only have to hit 60% for your identified disability. Actually, any subgroup. So economically disadvantaged, disability, minority groups, and so forth. So um, you have to have a score of 40 or higher to be in the meets to exceeds. We had, in our identified disability subgroup, students with IEPs, individual education plans. 11 of those students in our school scored a 39. <laughs> 11 kids, one point off. That would have raised our percentage from 35% to 57%. And math, eight students scored within three points of that 40. Seven within one point, one student within three points. So while I can look at that and say, oh, if a few more kids, the other thing is, well, next year I'd have to show a minimum of 10% gain on top of that and 10% gain. So I figure that uh, calculating that out, within three years I'll have to be at the 66% mark anyways, no matter what, safe harbor or otherwise. So it's, I have a, a triple C principal breakfast on Thursday at the Down Easter. We're going to have a good laugh over this one. That's, that's one of our favorite topics right now. So, um, the graphs that you have before you, you have a copy of a graph uh, that has a, a bold blue and a bold red bar in it. I believe it's in your packet. And that particular one tells you in grades 5, 6, 7, and 8. Um, if you look at the blue bar on that, it says that pretty much our school, except for a dip in the seventh grade, our, our students pretty much are flirting in reading with uh, the exceeds the standard range. Very close to that. 
although you asked a question about a significant difference maybe or something like that. I believe on the, on the kneecaps it's two points, but I've got to go back and double check that. Two points being a significant difference? A significant difference. Thank you. And if you look on the, on the reverse side of that graph, you'll see that our students are within two points, two points, seven points, and two points. That particular uh, dip that we see in the seventh grade, we saw it in the sixth grade, we saw it in the fifth grade, it, it has been consistent about the performance difference with that group all the way through. Um, certainly something that we see and recognize and we put plans in and we work on, we're just not seeing the impact of that at this point. Uh, and in comparison, I can give you a good example of why. If you look at the, uh, the green, blue, yellow, and red charts, if you look at the seventh grade, what you see, I was just talking with Steve Price about it, he noted, let me see if I say this right, say it again, Steve. <laughs> we have, thanks, thanks. That should be easy to remember. So the lows aren't as low and the highs aren't as high. Uh, you see that in the uh, upper ranges, in the seventh grade, for instance, we had 14% of the students uh, proficient with distinction in reading, while in the fifth grade, it was 43%, and 37% and 37% for the other two grades, so significantly different. Uh, in our does not meet are significantly below was 1%. So a very large group of those students, 71%, met the standards. But you don't get the same point total for meeting the standard that you do for the group that gets over, over the next bar into the exceeds the standard, of course. And you see that in the reading side of it, and then when we turn that over, you see it again repeated in the, in the math side of it. So that is one of those statistical pieces that uh, at this point is not an anomaly. We, we recognize that, and we're continuing to try to throw as many different options as we can at that particular program. What we're hopeful for is that our kneecaps that we take next fall will demonstrate some kind of progress toward uh, helping more kids make the jump over, over the next bar, whether they're in the partially proficient or the proficient to get to the next level. Uh, the last graph that you have has a comparison of our, uh, what I consider to be our partner schools. And I say partner schools because uh, when I work with these other three schools, one of the things that we try to figure out is, so what are you doing with the kids who aren't making it? Because we're all looking at it going, but between 85 and 90 percent of our kids are, make, are meeting the standards or exceeding the standards. So we know we've got four great school systems. And it's really, it, when we all receive students who are ready to learn. Parents send us kids who are prepared to learn. So we're looking at it from the perspective of, so how do we raise that? We've talked about it a little bit. How do we raise that floor? How do we help some of these kids out? Uh, and what's happening in the different schools and what resources are being used to do that? So you have uh, scoring bands here. Um, one of the ones that's a real statistical anomaly that's gone all the way through is um, Yarmouth's uh, current eighth grade. We've seen that each year that they're just uh, and I've talked with Bruce Brain about that, and he just says, that's been that group, that's them, they're just, they're all over it. Um, and their gender issues and so forth, uh, there's no difference. The boys score equally well in the reading, and the girls score equally well in the math. Um, so overall, our school has 86.5% proficiency in reading and math, getting over the bar, and we're Certainly not done with that. We, we have intentions to uh, continue to accelerate that. What questions do you have for me? Sure. John. Um, Steve, is, is meeting the standard, the state standard, is that enough? Is we, if we're asking our students to meet the, the state standard, would we, let me put the question this way. If all of our students were meeting the state standard, would we all go home and, Would we be satisfied? and rest? And okay, the state standard, this stuff says, are you meeting the standard? Whether you're meeting it or exceeding it, it's, you have to at least meet the standard. That's their threshold. This kind of information doesn't talk about our schools saying, do we all meet the standard and are we good enough with that? Because, for instance, in this group, what we're seeing is, in this group, <laughs> we're seeing that 71% of the students are in that blue category that are meeting the standards. 
what's going on with that group? Why do we see such a disparate number of, uh, from 43% to 14%? Um, to Why is there such a difference? These kids come, they live in the same streets, they come from the same neighborhoods, they pretty much maybe have siblings in the same houses, and, and so how come we're seeing this? What's happening? Um, with this. So we're trying to do a lot of data analysis and figure out well, how do we address some of this. Um, so we, we're certainly not satisfied with any of those groups and I think uh, a great example of that would be the uh, yearly increase when I did the MEAs and, and that's online you can access it at the uh, school website under the, the school profile from 2009, 8-9. Uh, you'll see that our last MEAs it demonstrates a tremendous growth over the last four years from uh, the number of students who met to getting over the bar into the exceeds the standard range. So our expectations are here. However, this state report says let's start here and see where you go from there. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm curious, Steve. Uh, I'm looking at the, it seems, um, this is a lot of data to absorb. Uh, one quick question: When it says kneecap reading, is that which? Uh, sh which I'm uh, sorry, it's, it's the yeah, uh, line comparison graph. charts. This one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, my eyesight's not good enough. It has it's the one reading with a uh, gate found with hammer yeah. through the arms. What is reading? This is going to sound stupid, but it isn't. Is reading mean just literally reading comprehension, or is it also writing? Uh, there are two separate. Next year will be the first time that we'll get a writing score from anything standardized. Um, we had uh, 2005 was the last year. Then, there was a, then, then they dropped the writing portion for a year, and then they did a calibration, and then we switched tests, and, and they were going to do another calibration. So we're calibrated to death and ready to go. We want those writing scores. So we've been relying on our common writing assessments to give us information about where students are in that regard. This is specifically a reading mm -hmm. component, okay. which would get into uh, a lot about uh, the uses of, it gets into, in that, it gets into uses of grammar, it gets into vocabulary, it gets into uh, comprehension components. Well, uh, writing I'm particularly interested in, because I know that's something you've worked very hard on in middle school to improve. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that middle school and high school continue to need to improve. And um, so I'm glad to hear that we're gonna, you have some statistics, and hopefully these will. The other thing I've noticed from this is it consistently seems with all schools a drop off from sixth to seventh, and a fairly, and then Cape and Yarmouth take off from seventh to eighth. Well, uh, let me give one example though. It on seems this. fairly consistent. I'm just curious. You... But first of all, let me give one example about this. And, and Tom mentioned this piece. This is one data point. You mean one year? One year, right. one group's data point. And we, we would all say, any, anyone who has been working on this information with me or in other schools that we've shared information, we'd all say, hmm, this kneecap was really a different test. It, it, it was not the same as our previous knee, uh, MEAs. That's why we're so excited they were compared. Um, and so when we look at that, we see, boy, look what happened in reading in all four schools. And look at that sharp line, like the blue line, and the red, uh, our school line, and so forth. There's only one school that went in the opposite direction that started to show an increase at that point. What was it about that seventh grade test? That's our, that's our first question, because we don't see quite that disparity with all four groups in previous testing. Well, I, I just a note for the public to be cautious about these things exactly. because it is one year and, and, I, and we fully well know that you could have a class and we talk about schools these, these size that happens to be just a great class, a bubble class, and it could highly distort this data. You really need to look at trends over four to five years if you really want to compare schools. I think um, when you look at the SAT scores on, um, on this year's junior class, that going all the way through, that was the class that we just I, like. I, I noticed Yarmouth. that when I saw how many made National Honor Society, mm -hmm. that, that seemed to be a bubble class. Yeah, and that was the same group we looked at and said, wow, no difference, no, no disparity in the gender issues and so forth. Any other questions for me? I, I, the only thing I would add, and going along with what you said, just said, David, this is one picture, and it's an important picture because it is a national assessment, but we do look at all the others, so you're absolutely right I, I feel it's important for you to see this on the national standard, but also know that we're using many other 
standards as far as data to, to get there. Right. And we also, NECAP is new. And so there are some pieces that will, like he just talked about the writing, et cetera, will be added later on. And I, and I main reason for doing it was caution the public who is listening that right. this is a snapshot. It's a, next year we could be way up and young. It's, it's really important to look at overall. And I would just add that um, you know, it, would, it would be great if we could show a trend, but unfortunately we keep changing the tests. So um, we can't use two years ago and include the kneecaps for this year to show a three-year trend. I mean, that, would, that, that would be my first desire is to be able to actually co co collect over time three years' worth of data. And since I've been on the board, we haven't been able to do that. But uh, moving on to the high school, Jeff. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that um, I think the first year that No Child Left Behind was in force, um, he Elizabeth High School was actually on the very first list for AYP, and it was reading, and it was identified disabilities group. Um, since then, we've avoided that. Um, I think we've been protected by some safe harbor things. I don't understand entirely the psychometrics of it, but... Um, so we're not on it this year, uh, but Steve and Tom are completely correct. We will absolutely, unless they change the law, we will absolutely be on it at some point. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the differences between the, the high school assessment system and what happens at the middle school and high at, at the middle school and the elementary school. Um, unlike the other two schools, um, our kids our kids are tested just once for statewide purposes. And Matt actually alluded to the pleasure of taking SATs this past weekend. Um, and that was not just Cape Elizabeth High School juniors taking the SATs, that was every junior in the state of Maine taking the SATs. And the results of the junior classes across the state will lead into another list once we get those results. Um, in addition to the SATs, what the state has done is, is, and they've changed this a little bit, um, they recognized that the SAT covered 80 to 90% of the standards in English language arts and math, but the other one that is tested is science for purposes of AYP. Um, so two years ago, <coughs> excuse me, the state ask the students to take the SAT, but then at the, at, in high schools what happened <clears throat> is that there was a, an additional test that students had to, had to take that included what they called math augmentation <coughs> questions. In other words, topics in math that aren't covered so much in the SAT, they primarily had to do with statistics and probability. Um, that, actually, that was three years ago. Then two years ago, they added to the augmentation exam some questions in science. And that's why in the graphs that you have, there are three years of comparison data based on the SATs in reading and writing and math, but there's only two years in science. Um, this past year, the only augmentation questions were actually in science. Um, I'm not sure how that came to be. I don't know if there was a, ch I, I can find out if anybody's interested but I was just grateful that um, they were accepting the SAT as the sole assessment for, um, for math, the area of math. Um, so, so that's sort of the process. It's similar to, but different from, because the instrument is quite different. I will tell you, I, I for one, was one of the, I think, a minority of principals who was delighted when the state went to the SATs. It's still not my gold standard of external, external accountability systems. I'm not going to go off on that tangent because I could go on for a long time and I'm not necessarily representative of the, the high school staff or certainly most principals, but for me, the SATs count. It's important to students. The MEAs never counted. Um, and so it was always a struggle to sort of figure out what external sort of motivators you use uh, to try to get students to do well. We don't have to try to get students to do well. They're giving their best, they're giving their best effort and it's and it's a really pretty quality assessment. It doesn't measure everything that's important, but it's a pretty quality assessment. So how did we do? Um, and I'm not gonna, I have the graphs here, I'm not gonna hold them up because they'd be way too small. Uh, and let me first talk about math. Um, by any 
measure that you want to use, uh, whether you're talking about the percentage of students who exceed the state standards, whether you're talking about the, the percentage who combined meets and exceeds, or the percentage at the other end who do not meet or partially meet, um, or if you want to look at just the overall average in math, um, Cape Elizabeth High School students perform at the stop, at the top of the state in math, year after year after year. Um, that's not to say we can't do better. One of the reasons why I think our students do perform so well, there's two reasons, I think, for the most part, and that is that there is a consistent curricular back, uh, backbone in math that sort of carries all the way through. There are criticisms of that backbone, and it doesn't work 100% for everybody. But the existence of that consistent strand throughout um, is a huge piece. So that the high scores that our, get, our kids get are a reflection not just of the work that's being done in the high school, but in Pond Cove and the middle school before. And it's consistent, and it works towards a common goal. Um, the other reason our students do really well is our, te our math teachers take it really seriously. They are data hounds. Um, and they will not rest if they think they can get a few more points because they think the, the, the assessment is a quality assessment. So they don't apologize for being very concerned about how the kids are doing on tests that count and that matter and that are good quality assessments. Um, so that's the picture in, in math. Um, the picture in reading um, is not quite as consistent. Um, here are the highlights that I picked out. Um, two out of the last three years, Cape Elizabeth High School students scored top in the state in terms of the percentage of students who meet or exceed. That means one year we did not, um, unlike math. For the past two years, we were either first or second um, in terms of the fewest, the smallest percentage of students who are in the partially meet or do not meet category. That means one of those three years we were not first or second. Uh, so we do very well, we want to do better. In writing, it's sort of a similar picture. Um, and this again, it's based, the writing assessment, by the way, the writing measure, it's important to understand that the writing measure, the SAT now does include a written component. But that's not the entirety of what goes in, what, this also reflects students essentially grammar, essentially grammar awareness, grammar skill. So it's a combination of what they actually produce in the constructed essays that they have to construct, and it's a measure of how they recognizing grammar errors and improving sentences and that sort of thing. So the picture in writing is that two of the past three years, uh, we were first in terms of the percentage of students who meet or exceed. Two of the past three years, we were the lowest, which is where you want to be, in terms of the percentage of students who meet or does not meet. But that means that... Um, other schools beat us that, those, those third years. Um, and you can parse the numbers a number of different ways, and I'm sure the students, the, teach, the principals in our comparison schools parse the numbers in a slightly different way. But the bottom line is our, student, our students do well in all three areas. They do outstandingly well in math. We'd like to do better in math, in reading and writing, because to me, they're the same students. They have the same intelligence. They really ought to be performing at the same level, and I think that's the goal. Um, science. Science, I, we're talking two years worth of data, and I don't know what to conclude about it. Because the first of the two years that we have data, our students scored tops in this state in term, it, it, compared to our compar the comparison schools that we all talk about. Um, and, and therefore, tops in the state uh, for public schools. We were the top in one of the years uh, for the number of percentage of students who meet it or exceed. Um, the other year, which was last year, we were fourth among the comparison schools. I have no idea what to conclude about that. Uh, that I, I just don't know. Um, I do think that a part of it is that in science, unlike English or math, the test is much more content-oriented, and there's a bit of a crapshoot element in terms of what topics are emphasized. Um, and I will say this, that I think the, the, although I think we are doing absolutely the right thing with the physics first sequence, physics, physics, chemistry, biology, um, I think our students probably pay a bit of a price for that in terms of this particular standardized test uh, because number one, they haven't completed biology 
And number two, they haven't had at high school a class in earth science. And there's a certain percentage of, of, te of questions that are earth science. And when you look at the sort of science, interestingly, is the one area where they actually give you, I can look at subcategories and say, okay, our kids did really well in physical science, which they do. Um, but they didn't do quite so well in earth science. Like, why? Well, it's, we know why. Um, and biology, they do quite well, but they don't do quite as well as some of our comparison schools, because in most of the comparison schools, the kids have already finished. This year's questions, oh, I'm not sure I should say this in public, because I'm not supposed to officially know that. I've heard that um, there were a fair amount of ecology questions in this year's um, science augmentation assessment, and our kids haven't reached that yet by the time they take that assessment. Um, so just, just an awareness in terms of science. Then in terms of the list that Tom and Steve were talking about, the MDOE school achievement and progress list, um, here are for me the highlights. Uh, by three-year average, if you look at the three-year average of math and reading, reading combined, and for the purpose of that list, writing is not, doesn't count, and science doesn't count. It's all about math and reading. Uh, by three-year average, Cape Elizabeth High School students performed at the top of the state. Um, the meets and exceeds number was 82.78% on average over those three years. For Yarmouth, it was 80.56. Falmouth, 79.48. Greeley, 72.27. For two of the past three years, we were the top school um, for those two things combined. Um, last year, Yarmouth did beat us, and we welcomed the competition, and I use it to try to inspire the students to do well on the SATs. I'm not very good at rousing pep speeches, but I tried my best at the other day before the SATs. Um, Yarmouth did beat us by four hundredths of a percent, so we want that back. <laughs> it was 82.60 to 82.56. Um, <laughs> so our students are doing well. Are state standards my gold standard? No, absolutely not. Um, I, wanted, I, want us to I want our reading and writing scores to catch up to our math scores. That's Great. what I want. Any questions? I right. have a few. David, um, please do appreciate that we are at 8.20 and we have actually a pretty heavy um, thing. So, Oh, please, uh, I'll be real quick. You keep mentioning that we missed it one out of three years. Is that a consistent year that we missed it, or is there no pattern to that? There, uh, I, 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 I'm pretty sure there's not a pattern to it. Okay. I, I'll have to double check that, David, but I'm okay. pretty sure it was I'm, not. I'm trying to speed this up. Yep. Second, do we ever, I mean, it's, it's nice to compare ourselves to Maine and SAT. Do we ever compare ourselves to other states? Because, yep. quite frankly, we compete in colleges with a lot of other states besides Maine. I haven't done that recently, and I'll tell you that the, um, since Maine is one of the, I think there's only two states in the country that require the SATs of every student, um, so it's hard to get an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Before Maine went to that, I, we did fairly consistently look at, for example, Brookline or Lexington and that sort of stuff. Um, and I do need to try to get back to that. I haven't done that recently to see because I am very interested in that and our mission is to be one of the top schools in the United States. I'm sensitive to that. We were extremely competitive with those schools, um, extremely competitive with those schools. Thank you. We've, we've since dipped a little bit since we went to every single junior taking it because I mean, although the vast majority of our students always took the ACTs, even that tiny percentage who might not have in the past makes a, it makes a pretty significant difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all the principals for your work on that um, and your reporting. Um, there are several gentlemen here who have been waiting very patiently to um, perhaps comment or present um, some information. So if it's okay with the board, I'm going to jiggle the uh, agenda around a little bit, and I'd like to jump down to 6F, which is the K through 12 mathematics curriculum priority learning goals. Is there any objection? Do you juggle or juggle? <laughs> no objection. <laughs> okay, Alan. Uh, John, uh, okay, there are two of you who are going to speak about them. What, what I just will remind everyone that this evening, 
Uh, what they do is a very brief uh, presentation on their goals themselves, just so you have a sense of what they are. I believe you have received them. Uh, you've also received the full math report. But they will do a brief overview of them. And I have, uh, John and I have talked several times, it will be a pretty brief overview. Yeah, I'd like to ask the board to hold questions for this evening. That we are going to be having a, a, a workshop. Um, and I sent out an email at uh, some point today saying that we had to reschedule it um, for June 1st on the math um, curriculum. So Is it both the goals and the... Uh, it's all encompassing. Oh, okay. It's just like what we've done in the past. T tonight is just the goals, Tonight's and then the on the first it will be both the whole the whole. Night. So okay. Thanks for pushing us up. Um, the work represented here and in your packets has evolved over a long period of time, um, and it's been somewhat of a circuitous route. Um, informal analysis of the math standards started in the mid 1980s with the NCTMs, and David, that's the National Council of Teacher of Mathematics. And I'm not the only one who misses these. No, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give them all. And uh, they came out in the early 80s, and it was really the first time any of us that were teaching math looked at what we were doing and said, hmm, that's interesting. We're doing a lot of what they say. Um, further analysis came and, and really intensified uh, in 1997 when the main learning results came out. Um, that really jumped past it. Um, we had to revise our analysis in 2007 because the main learning results were revised again. And then in 2008, the main learning results became the PEIs, uh, which are the parameters for essential instruction. And all the work that you see in front of you today is aligned with Maine's parameters of essential instruction, which were, came out in 2008. And basically that was the work that we finished in 2008 and 2009. Um, the information that you have has been aligned um, with subsections and strands called number, data, geometry, and algebra. And as I said previously, we completed this work in the, in the school year of 2008-2009. Um, we were under the understanding that we would have presented these, I think, in the fall of 2009 this year, but things got off task. Um, this work probably would have been finished sooner. Um, but was slowed down by the changing in the standards that I just mentioned. Um, the high school got caught up, Jeff, what were the years in the accreditation process? 2004, five, I think. Forever. Yep. <laughs> and then we got, we were really making progress early and then came the, the mandated assessment program from the state. So we, we were really close several times to finishing it and other things came along and, and, and waylaid it, but it is now done. Um, but the first thing I need to tell you is that the, the charts that you have in front of you, it, it's impossible to get a grasp of what's on there if you look at the charts in a pamphlet notebook format. Um, we, we tried to do it. You, you just can't do it. It really has to be cut out and pasted and placed on a chart and looked at both horizontally and vertically at the same time. Um, that way you can see each grade level, each strand, in each skill. Um, for example, if you come over here and, and look at some of these, you'll notice when you go through your packets, we start out with the yellow of your strands, the four strands. And I, I held my breath and then the MEAs went to the kneecaps because we had already gone to the PEIs, we had organized our curriculum by these four strands, and then the state said we're going to save some money and we'll do an assessment. And I couldn't believe it when I went to see him and said, see, the assessment matches the PEIs, four strands. There's some sections are the same. Now, and then like other people said, don't get me started. The core, if they change the core standards, all of this is out the window. Because there's like nine strands in middle school. And this would all change. So, but if you look at this, you can see that it can start out in grade levels, kindergarten. Grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4, grade 5, grade 6, and it all goes according to the strands and the skills listed in each strand. And then when you get to the middle school, starting with rational math, you start to see the formation of courses. And, but still, even as we stay in courses, rational math, transitional math, part 1, transitional math, full year, algebra, geometry, we still stay organized within the strands. Okay? 
But when you get to the high school, the high school does not stay consistent with the strands. Reasons being, algebra is, a, is one course in itself. So if we went by the strand, that one horizontal strand would go ad nauseum. It just because it constitutes the entire course. Geometry, the same thing. It's very long. It would go in one direction under on one strand. So the easiest way, and you know, we can place this anywhere we need it in Alan's office, there's one in Steve's office, is if you're really trying to make sense of it, is to look at it this way. Because if you look at the online packet, we have to make smaller PDF forms. And you can't, once you go through it, you lose which grade level or which strand it is you're trying to follow. And we found that this is the best way to present the information and to uh, grasp it. That'd be great. We have this, both the secondary and our goals. Yeah, they brought those packs. And we just wanted you to see it in this form because that's the way we've been working with it. Mm -hmm. And you can yeah. take your papers apart and look at them. There's a really great flow. Uh, and, and John often. And then the secondary goals are on the back. Uh, yeah. You can see that they're not as bad. It's done the same way. <laughs> Although there's plenty of high school here. Cheers. If you could leave that in Alan's office, I think that would be very Absolutely. Yeah, sure. That would be great. And, um, you know, I don't want to try to do that in my house. <laughs> no, and, and it was the only way that we could work when we changed from the main learning results, which had nine performance indicators to four. It was the only way that we could do it, too. It, it just made sense to work that way because we could move skills within, within grade levels and, and, and within courses. Because we do change the courses. When we get to our middle school, we change the courses, and uh, it, it changes to become more like the high school. The other um, assessment that we use, and have used better this over the last couple of years, is the NWEA, which is a wonderful online assessment. The kids all take it on computer. Um, and its breakout categories are these same, same. four as well. That's and great. so you can look at the kid and see that their number sets is really strong and their data is much more weak. And as teachers, we can target that data really well. We can say, wow, this, this kid really needs more of that. And so the differentiation of the individual instruction possibilities are great. So using this now that we have it clearly laid out and some of the, of the assessment tools that we're using, I think it's, it's pretty powerful. And uh, that, suffice to say, the curriculum that's presented here is, is the foundation of our very, very strong program. Um, but most importantly, like Jeff said, it's, it's the fact that we have some fantastic teachers who drive it and, um, and make it exciting and try to meet each child at its level of readiness and inspire their curio curiosity and, and ongoing discovery about the power of mathematics. Um, so there's the foundation. But couple it with the people who drive it, that's what makes CAPE's program and the, and the kids that we get to teach as strong as it is. Great, thank you. Thank you. I, I would encourage the board to take the next um, week or so to thoroughly review the packet. Um, and if in that review things come to mind that you don't understand or um, provoke some questions, to please compile those questions and send them on to Mary so that she can share them with the math curriculum team and they have a chance to prepare ahead of time um, for any sort of um, thought process that board members are having around math curriculum. Okay. And we understand that um, our presentation has been shifted from the 27th to the June 1st. June 1st. So I apologize for that, but the uh, budget process continues to yet hold sway over <laughs> David. Um, I thought I have to tell you I, I wish we had this kind of an organization for all of our uh, areas. I just have one general question, and it may be too late in the game because it's already set in stone. But it's it's a fundamental vertical and horizontal curriculum problem that I became fully aware of this year, but always noticed it, and that is. We went to physics first um, and not requiring algebra to be taught in eighth grade. There is, seems to be significant and painful delinking 
And since we're talking about goals, that would be, just so you know in advance, is there a way that we can teach algebra to the majority of people in eighth grade so that when they go to high school, they're not trying to learn algebra and the achievement center and with tutors and falling behind in physics with the other kids who've already had it? So David, that is a perfectly wonderful question that I encourage you to submit to Mary so that she can compile all of the board questions. I already have submitted it to Mary, yeah. ahead of you. I just thought I would want John and um, I'm sure he will see all Jeff the questions that. once that Mary is able to pass them on. Okay, any other questions from the board? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we're on um, one last little change, and that is to look at new business item 7F. If you can find please your materials that are um, toward the back of your packet. It's consideration to approve the following staff nominations for 2010-2011. Uh, Caitlin Ramsey for Middle School Instru Instrumental Music and um, Linda Alfiero um, Ponko, K-5 teacher. She's the yeah, teacher leader. Ellen. So you want me to go ahead? Yes. Okay. What I, uh, so basically, again, I see there are several people in the audience on these, and so I think it's only fair because we do have a pretty long agenda this evening. The first one is Caitlin Ramsey, uh, and I, I would like to speak to her just briefly, and then I would ask uh, either Steve and or Tom if they would like to comment on it as well. Uh, you have in your packet a letter uh, from Steve talking about the uh, interview itself and the candidates. As he noted, there were over 50 applicants for this job. Which, was, uh, which we were very excited about as we saw it. But not only did we have 50 applicants, but we had some extremely, extremely talented people applying for this job. Uh, as you know, uh, Steve wrote, after scrutinizing applications, meeting candidates, and conducting classroom visits for final round candidates, and they traveled uh, into central Maine and traveled pretty far southern Maine to look at these candidates. The committee resoundingly supported the candidacy of the following person, and this is Caitlin Ramsey which I would let, the, let, let them speak about. But I would say uh, my normal practice is that they make a recommendation and I invite the person in to meet them myself, to talk with them and hear what they have to say and how well they do. Uh, I will be very honest with you. I've met many candidates over many years. And this young lady is by, by far the most confident, understands, I'm not a musician, please understand, but understands music to the nth degree. She was just unbelievable. Uh, I think she will be an a unbelievable uh, member of the middle school staff. Her music uh, abilities will definitely complement Tom's at the high school, and I think that's important. And I think I heard one person say they went to a concert that she did recently and left with tears in their eyes because of what she was able to do with those students. So uh, Tom and or Steve and or both, if you would like to speak about her briefly, I'd appreciate that. <clears throat> Thanks so much for uh, hearing us. Uh, it's a bittersweet moment for all of us in Camp Elizabeth uh, who have had the great pleasure of working with Terry White down through the years, uh, one of the finest teachers that uh, one can imagine, and to replace someone like that is it's a very daunting task. We're very fortunate in this situation to have some of the very, very best people who are our teachers in uh, New England to be able to uh, be involved and be interested in, in uh, teaching in Cape Elizabeth. And I think that's a great tribute to the work that Terry has done and the quality of the school system. I'm, I'm, I'm fully confident that um, Caitlin Ramsey is going to do unbelievable things because I honestly believe, other than Terry, that she is the uh, best middle school teacher in the uh, state of Maine. So the future is, I think, very, very bright for us. And uh, we were both in observing Terry's band session this morning at about 7.15, I guess, somewhere around there. And uh, we both told Terry he was fired. So, uh, <laughs> Steve was shoveling dirt. Steve <laughs> was shoveling dirt and stamping on it. <laughs> he was conducting away saying something to me. I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, I'm sure it was clever. Um, 
we, we, I think we've got 400 miles on each one of us uh, from going around because we, we did the, um, the, the application pool, the applicant pool was tremendous. We had over 50 people for that. And the, and the people who we pulled to do, to, to meet in the interviews, outstanding. We really could have hired any of those people. Um, Tom and uh, Ted told me, he said, you, we're, we're going to have, when you look at this list, you won't believe that these are the best musicians, the best middle school teachers. Oh, we're, we're in great shape. And the one thing that I heard consistently from people as I went out there is part of the reason they want to join Cape Elizabeth. Everybody said the same thing. I said, you know, what a great reputation the community has supporting the arts and the and, and the, the caliber of the students, the quality, the, the preparedness that they have. But they also mentioned, do you know what it would be like to be in a program where you send those people to Tom Lazar? So that's, that's, that's another great piece. Um, my, my, Carrie and I uh, get a little bit of a kick out of this all the time. My father was the first person to hire him in education, and I told him I'd be the last person to fire him. So <laughs> we're ready to go. Caitlin's going to be outstanding. She's going to hit the ground running. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you. Also for finding an excellent candidate, I might add. Uh, is she from Lincoln? Yeah, I will. Hi, me? Is she from Lincoln? No, she's not. No. Just checking. <laughs> However, one of the other candidates was. Of course. <laughs> Just so you know that. Uh, our second one is Linda Alfiero, who has been selected by the Ponco teacher to be the Ponco teacher leader for 2010 to 2012. Uh, I, some of you who have been new to the board had asked how that process happens. And on the back of the um, recommendation for Linda is the job description itself. I would remind you that uh, the choice of a teacher leader first began, I believe, seven years ago. And it was when it was decided that the Pond Cove would no longer have an assistant principal, but would go to a teacher leader situation. We have had this, uh, Linda will be the fourth one. We did have a hiatus uh, for one year uh, in, in the process because of some, some issues we, we dealt with. We brought in Pond Cove people to help write this job description. We have had some amazing people doing this. And I think you will find Linda is in the same boat. Linda is coming in at a time where we are taking a very serious look at our literacy programs. And uh, it is going to be extremely important that she along with uh, a couple of other people really work with us to assess, review our programs and all the pieces to our programs uh, as we move along. So I'm very pleased to let you know that Linda is going to be in that position. I have uh, extended it to grade five so that she will be doing some work with a transition point. And I would ask Tom if you have anything you would like to say about Linda uh, before we move ahead. Well, first of all, just to mention Lisa, Linda, she's the perfect candidate for this because the uh, teacher leadership um, position was designed that the person in that position would get us over the next hurdle. We uh, identified um, when um, Becky Swift was there, we worked on the reading program. And Shari Robinson has worked hard with SST and the math and the uh, highest priority, priority now is literacy again but in a different way and the new focus going to grade five meant that she was the perfect candidate. We limited the term to two years because we don't want teacher leadership um, associated just with the position so the people who have had these positions then go back to their other roles and the idea is to distribute leadership capacity around the school and from my perspective that certainly worked. Um, it, it's, it's been a remarkable process, and uh, I thank Alan for supporting it. The process he mentioned a few years ago extended the understanding of the position to the whole staff. So I think they, they're fully involved in it, and they, they fully support this person. Thank you, Tom. Um, may I have a motion for the consideration of Caitlin Ramsey as the middle school instrumental music, music teacher? I move that we... Uh, we um, accept Caitlin Ramsey as the middle school instrumental music teacher replacing Terry White. Is there a second? Second. Mary, thank you. Any uh, discussion? All those in favor? Seven. Okay, I uh, may have a motion for Linda Alfiero as Ponco K-5 teacher leader. So moved. Okay, second. 
Second. Gotcha, Denise. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Okay, thank you, school board, for letting me do that. Um, we're going to go back now under six communications to the substance abuse survey. Jeff. No. Um, two years ago, our students took a survey called, the acronym is MIDAS, which stood for Main Youth Drug and Alcohol Use Survey. Um, and last year, the results of that survey were on the website and through hope and some communications to parents, we sort of communicated that because we think it's really, really important for folks to know. Um, last year, the state changed the survey and essentially consolidated the MIDAS survey, which was strictly a drug and alcohol use survey, and another survey that they did which deals with broader topics of health and wellness and eating and things like that. Um, our students took that survey just before the April break last year. We got what I would consider pretty disappointing reports of the results, not that they were bad, but they weren't nearly the same level of usefulness or quality or aggregate or subcategories and that sort of stuff as we got with the MIDAS survey. And so the report I'm going to give is just really to highlight a few things. We are supposed to be getting um, a, a, a more detailed report that should be available within a couple of weeks. The report that we have right now, the thing that I'm most concerned about, it, unlike the MIDAS uh, survey, report which broke down results by grade level so you could see what the percentages were for each grade level right now for it's just high school by the aggregate mm -hmm. um, so the results came really late honestly part of it I, I'm, I'm not ready to give a report because I still have some work to do with it um, we as we did with Midas um, there are five schools um, who have agreed to sort of trade results and so we are glad to do that um, I'm still waiting to get results from one of those schools, which I really want to see. Uh, so before we put anything on the website and do that sort of thing, I need to spend some time probably over the summer get, getting that last school's results in and then beginning to actually compare the results of MIDAS and uh, to, to begin to look for trends. And I just haven't done that at this point. So this is just some quick bullet highlights, which is probably appropriate for the time. Um, the good news. Uh, there appears to be a small decrease in the percentage of students who report that they use alcohol and marijuana. That's good. Um, on the other side, our students report compared to the comparison schools that we look at um, that although there's a decrease from the year before to last year, um, that we're still higher than some of the other schools. Um, the other thing that is a trend that, and again, whether it's statistically significant or not, I'm not sure. I have to study it more. But one of the things that worries me is that our students report an increase in binge drinking from the year before until last year's results. Um, so those, that, and that is, that is really the highlights. Um, those are still very preliminary. I will tell you in terms of binge drinking, again, 9 through 12 is just an aggregate number. That's all I've got. 24% of our students report having, there's a definition of drinking five, five drinks in a row. It's 24% of our students. Um, so almost a quarter. Uh, in a row? What? You mean like in a night? Or? In an, yeah, in a, one session, yeah. Okay. Um, one drink of alcohol in the past 30 days, 38.5% of our students report. Um, marijuana use over the past 30 days, 25.2% of our students report, both of which numbers are slightly lower by 2 to 3% than they were the year before. Binge drinking was up a comparable number, so that's, that's concerning. Um, and I will say that the school is continuing to work really closely with the Hope Action Team, which I am delighted to have been a part of from the very beginning to try to encourage the community to break the silence around the topic of substance abuse in Cape Elizabeth, because it's a huge problem. Um, I will say that Hope is working on a 
major presentation that um, that will probably take place either in the spring or the fall um, because we actually have a couple of families of graduates who step forward and are willing to talk uh, about their experiences. Um, I'm not going to give any more details now. Uh, there's a lot of details to work out, but I think it could be tremendously exciting. We've never before had students, mom, and dad. That's really, if we can, if we can pull this off, that could be really exciting. Um, I think it's probably going to happen in the fall because I think it's the best time. I think right now people are really kind of worn down in terms of the calendar. So that's probably going to be a big push in the fall. I think it's going to be sponsored by Hope. I shouldn't speak for them because that decision hasn't been made. It will, but one way or another it will happen. Thank you. Be exciting. Kathy, question for you. Um, my sources tell me that that um, um, survey is flawed in that the kids like to put answers down that they think will uh, get reactions. Yep. Um, what is your sense of how valuable this survey is or, or how, or how uh, flawed it may be? Um, I guess, yeah, I, I, there's, there's undoubtedly that factor. It's very difficult to figure out how large or how significant that is. It's hard for me to believe that our kids would be, have any different reaction, would be, would be any less reliable as reporters than students in comparison schools. Um, so, that, so, that we, so I think there is some legitimacy to compare. Um, and certainly I think the trends are still fair. The numbers, I'm sure, are not 100% accurate, but they're the best we have, um, and so they're, they're what we work with. I will also say that in any of these surveys, there are some questions that are built into the surveys that are designed to identify students who are making things up um, because there are questions that are put in that if you know enough about them, you would realize they really don't make any sense. Um, but the students don't, and so when students begin to answer those questions as if they make sense, those results are just thrown out. Um, so there is a, an effort within the survey to try to Thank take you. that into account. Chair? Sure. Can I ask one question? Oh, sorry. Are there any questions on this side? Dave? Um, do you question about uh, abuse of prescription drugs? There are questions in there about that as well. Okay. I didn't see. I didn't see a particular trend quickly, but that will be in the report, and eventually, the whole report will be on will be on the website. Thank you. Yeah. Linda, when did you say the test was given again? I'm sorry. I... It was given um, the week before the April vacation last year. The, they, the people who, who design these surveys and plan out the logistics of their surveys ask school, schools to give their surveys um, within a two-week window before a major vacation um, so that when students are asked questions about looking back 30 days, that's essentially 30 days of, that are Normal. basically routine school right. periods, not okay. with vacations in the middle. Do you think that the, have you, thought of giving it at a different time, I mean, still within that same period, but do it fall or something like that before Thanksgiving or something? We're not allowed to. Oh. We're not, they, they define the windows, oh, and the okay. windows are essentially just before the February break right. or just before the April break. Oh, okay. Thank you. So you said it was given last year. There's no test. Uh, test. There's it's every other every year now. Year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I do have one question. Mary. Um, the schools... Uh, can, can you talk for just a moment about the schools that we share information with? Do we know who these schools are? How I know who they are, are but I knew who they are. <laughs> and you, do you think they're comparable, that the yes, communities yes, are comparable? I, but part of the, part of the deal we strike is that in the, com in the comparisons that we do, that we don't name the particular schools. Mm -hmm. um, but if you know who they are. I do know who they are, yes. I do know, absolutely know who they are. <laughs> okay. And they are, they, are good, they are good comparison schools. Thank you. Um, okay. Are, are you talking about the substance service? Oh, yes, is there in the middle school also? I'm sorry. Uh, okay. That's fine. Uh, so, Kathy, I think you might have asked the question about the, the, the reliability, the validity yes. factor. And they do put in, they embed into that, as Jeff was alluding to, they embed truth questions. So they will actually void, quite, they will actually void information that they feel does not match up to that truth question. Thank you. 
Um, we had, um, so out of our statistics, there were really very few pieces in there that I would pull out and say was surprising or something like that. I think uh, for the most part what it says is that we have students who feel that they can talk openly with their parents and, and that there are conversations that occur about uh, uh, a wealth of different topics related to health and safety, whether it's substances, uh, sexual activity, um, whether it is uh, bullying, um, self-esteem, so forth. So the kids um, overwhelmingly reported that there are conversations. The, the, uh, the, the vast majority of kids self-report that they're making excellent decisions at this age. A um, couple of things that I'll just note in here. Uh, the, the question number one was about, I agree or strongly agree with the statement, I feel safe at my school. 95.8% of the students said they, they agree with that, strongly agree. Um, and then the statistic that's a, a little bit telling in any school right now, I think, would be uh, question three was seriously considered attempting suicide during the past 12 months. And we had uh, 239 students that responded to the question, 7.5% said that that was the case, so that would represent a, about 18 students so in, in a 30-day time period. And we do, we do see those situations and come across them in the school, and so I would say that's a, a realistic statistic. Um, among students who have drunk more than a few sips of alcohol at one sitting, those who have had their first drink before the age of 11, other than a few sips, and um, we had 28 students who responded that they had had alcohol beyond a few sips at an occasion and that a third of them reported that it was before the age of 11. Um, the, a couple of things that are a little bit that, that we've got to do more of our health education around with students. Um, the question was would probably not or definitely not be caught by their parents if they drank some alcohol without their parents permission and uh, 25 0.4%, a quarter of our students said that's the case, that they wouldn't, wouldn't be caught. So we're talking about um, 55, 60 kids in middle school feel that way. Believe there is no risk or a slight risk when people take one or two drinks of alcohol nearly every day. Again, a quarter of the students felt there's no risk if you take a drink or two every single day. Um, our other statistics around marijuana, prescription drugs, and things like that, was extremely low. 88.9% of the students reported that they have not um, tried those kinds of substances. Um, although nearly 10% of our students feel that there is no risk or there is only a slight risk to harming themselves physically or in other ways when people smoke marijuana regularly. So it's not like and the case, like trying it is going to be harmful. This is on regular use. So again, that's information that we need to use to help us out in our health education programming. Uh, those are the only statistical kinds of things that I pulled out of there immediately to say what can help us out. Any questions? Okay. Quick question. <clears throat> and does the health team and the guidance, does the health team and the guidance team, are they do they agree with, have you shared it with them? Do they agree with the numbers? I've shared it with guidance at this time. We haven't had it very long. Um, and and we, we absolutely, in the, uh, in the SST, the student study team, or in, in those kinds of settings, we've looked at some of these statistics and said, mm -hmm. yep, mm -hmm. that, that's fairly accurate for our school in our view of, of who our kids are. And then from here, you target um, health classes to a population of kids that you it's health classes. Yep. It's um, beyond the health classes. It's also who are the speakers that we're looking to bring in. How do we, not just the students? How do we help to get this information back to the parents so that they start to see some of this mindset? Which this is a great opportunity to get some of that out. Thank you. And this is just two years or two or three years going. This is the this, year, this is last April, yep. uh, April a year ago, and we'll take it again in the next April. But we didn't take it two years before. Well. Uh, we oh, did right. take a different form. It was okay. referred to as the MyDOS. This is an integrated okay. survey that it pulls in uh, several other pieces. Thank you. It, it talks about healthy eating, good diet, and so forth. And the kids reported, uh, we're very pleased with those results. Thank you.
I know it's nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I can want forever in that circle. Okay. Um, moving on to the seven eight team teaching process, and I will um, update the board on that. Um, Kathy and Alan and Steve and I did meet um, and talk about it, and the proposal is that um, next fall there will be a workshop through the Teaching and Learning Committee um, where um, teachers, administrators, and the board will discuss the current instructional strategies that are utilized in 7th and 8th, areas and issues that have arisen to lead the middle school to consider changes, um, and the thinking behind extending team teaching to 7th and 8th, um, 8th grade. Um, so that will be a conversation that we'll have sometime in the fall. The Teaching and Learning Committee will be meeting tomorrow to discuss the timeline of all of the workshops because there's a number of, of issues that we do need to deal with. Um, so we have to kind of uh, figure out how we're going to fit everything into next year's academic calendar. Um, next year, I do need to, to note that um, uh, the middle school, in recognizing the compatibility of um, the English language arts and social studies curriculum, um, there will be some seventh grade teachers who will be teaching both subjects just in the seventh grade. Um, and then following the workshop, um, if the board questions have been um, satisfactorily answered, um, then I, th I think the understanding is that they will then move to parent discussions and, and uh, implementation at that point. Um, so that's the plan as it is. I, ex I expect that there'll be more information coming from the Teaching and Learning Committee following its meeting tomorrow. Okay. All right. Now we're I done. Questions? No. <laughs> Under new business. <laughs> I didn't put my hand down. <laughs> yes. Um, that, that's a, a, a very broad framework. Is the Teaching and Learning Committee going to flesh it out a bit? Is, is that the goal the Teaching and Learning Committee will flesh out? That process that you just described? The process is going to be similar to all the other teaching and learning committee workshops. There, the middle school will put a team together. They will um, come and to talk to the board at a workshop, and we will have a chance to pose questions beforehand so they can come prepared, and um, we will have a chance to ask questions at the meeting. Okay. I would suggest that you, that you ask these questions at the teaching and learning committee tomorrow. You suggest that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Moving on to new business. I'm sorry, not new business. AP Biology, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Sometime in the fall, uh, when the science committee presented at a school board workshop, one of the topics that was identified as an area that the high school um, needed to pay some attention to is the issue of biology um, and its relative strength strength compared, compared to physics and chemistry. I think it's been a lingering issue, particularly since we went to the physics first sequence, and I think that is part of it is that there's perhaps some unfinished business there. Um, so I have been mulling how to tackle that issue for a number of weeks. Um, and then over the past couple of weeks, I've, I've heard from, I had sort of coincidentally heard from some students and some parents that sort of put that issue back in my head again. Um, and so I apologize for the position, if it's put the board in an awkward position at all, um, about my proposal that I made, that I finally decided I th that was the right thing to do, which was to uh, look at taking a year off from teaching AP, one year off from teaching AP Bio with the expectation that it will be coming back the following year. That will allow us to do, to begin work on our Honors Biology curriculum and our AP Biology curriculum. Beginning with Honors Bio and then continue with AP Bio. Um, there's some data that I'm not going to, there's behind the concerns, our students, our students the last couple of years um, have been earning more ones and twos on the AP advanced placement biology exam than they did previously. Um, and that's a concern that I have and that Ms. Garrett, who teaches that class, has as well. Um, and, and that had not been the case. So we want to take a look at that. 
but we also want to take a look at the honors biology curriculum as well to see what we can do to enhance the rigor of that curriculum. Uh, I think it's really, really important. So on Friday, I sent out a notice to parents. It was later than it should have been, but it was on my mind, and I agonized, do I go ahead knowing that it's going to create some issues? And I decided that was the right thing to do. So I invited parents uh, and the students who would be affected to a meeting, uh, was it yesterday? Yesterday. Yes, that was yet. Monday was yesterday? Yes, Monday. And there were about uh, uh, students, rep there were 14 students and or their parents there, uh, roughly 14 or 15, I didn't take an exact count, but that was roughly what it was. And I think it's, I think it's fair to say um, that I think all of the parents came up with a, a better understanding of what my thought was, what the rationale is, what the logic is. Um, and I also asked the students to give to me some indication that if I chose to go ahead with the elimination, the, a one-year hiatus in AP Bio, which is all that it is, how that would affect the student's course selection, because that's something that I'm very sensitive to. Um, so I got a number of, I got some students responding to that last night, and then today I met with all of the other students with the exception of two. Um, two happened to be in band when I was trying, two or three happened to be in band when I was talking to students, um, and it's very difficult to, to get Mr. Liz get Tom's Don't attention when band, when band is in session. Um, so I had to move on. So I will be getting those other students' um, input. Um, the first thing I said last night to parents was I apologize for the lateness. The first thing I said today when I met with the students that I apologize for the lateness. I explained. They asked questions. I got some feedback from them about uh, what, how that might affect their thinking about course selection. Um, so by the end of tomorrow, I will have met with all the students and or their parents. Um, I have a couple of phone calls that I have to make to a couple of parents that I promised tomorrow, and I will follow up on that. Um, so, here are, some, here are some statistics. 37 students signed up. 37 students wanted originally to take AP Biology. Okay. Um, in fact, 37 students didn't actually think that they were in AP Biology because there is a screening process that we go through for, to get the first student, which is under school board policy and that sort of thing. So some of the students were actually surprised that I was talking to them yesterday because they had already built their schedules on the assumption that they were actually taking honors biology and AP biology and they hadn't chosen to appeal that. We were treating them as if they were in AP biology. But 37 students, roughly half of those 37 were not initially accepted, um, but actually built their schedules on an assumption of honors biology. So there wasn't any new information that they could give, they needed to give to me in terms of what their schedule might look like if I dropped AP Bio because they built schedules on the assumption they weren't going to have it. Um, um, of the remaining half of the students, uh, a few um, were not actually sure that they were actually were going to take AP Biology. They just had decided to um, take the exam and then they were accepted and they hadn't actually committed to in their heads that they were actually going to do it and they were actually sort of relieved about the possibility that it might not be offered. So then they wouldn't have to make the decision. Um, but I did get from them as well what it, but it was in their schedule. So from all the students I took information about okay what how would it affect your thinking about um, scheduling for next year. Of the remaining students, um, six of the students had a, very e a problem that was very easily solved um, because six of the students have decided that they would take AP Physics next year and then they would take AP Biology the following year when it returns. So really they are not, if they had AP Biology next year, they would have taken AP Physics as seniors, which is what they were planning to do. So for them, that worked out. Um, Taking AP Physics as a junior is not an easy thing to do, so that's not, I didn't expect, I did not expect that that would be the selection of most of the people. Um, a num I can't read my writing. Um, <laughs> I've okay, I've received backup choices for other students, for all the, from all the other students with the exception of the two or three that I still have to, like, it's either two or three. Um, and. Some of the selections involve things from deciding to prioritize. Mr. Ely will be thrilled to hear this. AP US History. Um, in, uh, some decided, as I said, AP Physics. Some have decided that they would be glad to take AP Macroeconomics. 
Um, some things, some have chosen to take things like photography, PE2, um, some art classes and things like that. Um, looking at the variety of alternate backup requests that I got um, and spending some time with that, what I can say to the board is I can accommodate 100% of the backup requests of every single student. Of the total number of students um, who had signed up to take AP Biology and thought that they were in it to begin with, I would say there were roughly four to six who were very disappointed that they wouldn't have the choice to take AP Biology next year. And I hate, I hate that that's a choice that I present to them or that's a decision that I may make to take that choice away from them. What I weigh is I think that the choice that I think is the right choice educationally for the school and the kids and the students um, is, a, is a choice that will allow us to work systematically to improve our biology curriculum that will benefit every kid who takes biology and particularly honors biology and AP biology. So my intention right now is to go forward uh, with that decision. I will still meet with a couple of students, um, but I think, it's, I think it's the right decision. I know it's late. I'm glad to ask and answer any questions that the board might have about that. But that's the process. That's the rationale. John. Um, can you just explain briefly what, what the year hiatus gives you? I, I, don't, I didn't yep. exactly it, follow that. First of all, what it gives is the opportunity, and I don't want to get too much into the high school scheduling, but we, what we try to do in the high school and every school is to control the number of separate courses that teachers are teaching. So by taking a one-year hiatus from, from AP Biology, what it allows me to do is um, take the other two biology teachers and have them both teach each of the other remaining levels and to work together systematically to really look at things. I've also looked into the possibility of getting somebody from outside the system to give us some, some input, but it allows us to focus beginning this summer around, okay, what can we do with the honors biology curriculum? What are the issues? Um, so it really buys that attention because traditionally what's happened uh, is that um, Sue Garrett has been teaching AP Bio and then she teaches college prep bio. And that's essentially to limit the number of preps. Bill Brewington teaches honors anatomy and physiology and genetics, which are two semester courses. Then he teaches um, the honors biology class. This allows me to keep their preps reasonable and to allow them to really focus because they will both be teaching both honors and CP biology so they can really focus their time and attention around that. At the same time, we will begin the process of looking at the AP biology curriculum because the, the recent dip in scores um, is, is not of long standing. Um, so we've got to think about and there hasn't and our curriculum is completely consistent with the college board curriculum. It's not a curricular issue. So I, I think a part of it is, I think one of the questions I have in my mind is that as, as we have expanded the number of AP choices that we have, have we made it harder and harder and harder to capture kids' attention on any one of them? Um, and I see some nodding heads. But it's basically trying to capture focus, to capture attention, to capture energy, and, to, and, and I hope to capture the ability to work with some my... So you're producing time in the schedules of the teachers who need to do curriculum planning, basically, in the area of AP biology. That is correct. Okay. That's right. Mary? Um, a couple of questions. Uh, do you foresee any other curriculum areas where you would like it? First of all, I'd like to commend you for sort of taking the break and um, taking a look at the curriculum. Um, I, I think that's very responsive and, and responsible. But do you foresee any other areas that you would take that break with, or is it just biology where you're seeing I don't, I don't have, I don't, not right now, no. Certainly not. It's not something that I've ever done before. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought it was an important enough issue that I'd like to mm -hmm. tackle it. And I think, I think, I know we have the talented teachers. I know they are competent, they are capable, they are knowledgeable. And I think we can solve the problem and, mm -hmm. and, and um, enhance the biology curriculum for all students. But no, I don't have... Um, I'm not saying I would not do it, but I certainly don't have a list in the back of my mind about after we tackle biology, we need to tackle something else. Certainly, if I get myself into this position again, I will be, I, it will happen earlier because I think if I had made the decision before the program of studies came out, we just said, as some high schools do, AP biology will be taking a year off this year and it will return the following year. You know, it would have been, I think it probably would have been a non-issue, but it became an issue. Um, just one 
quick sort of climate follow-up. I know that during the guidance meeting back in the fall, um, it, there was a, um, a brief discussion about AP, and I, I seem to remember you suggesting that stu parents support students in making fewer AP choices so they could really concentrate on areas that they were passionate right. about. Yep. Have you had any luck sort of getting students to back off from loading up on APs, or are they still feeling that pressure? They, they, they still feel that pressure. <coughs> they still feel that pressure because to get into the most competitive colleges, um, it's clear that the most competitive colleges like to see students take the most challenging classes that are available to them. Um, so that is a bigger issue, but I think that ex that's a bigger issue than AP Bio. Do I intend to continue to have that discussion and think about what we can do? Yes, I intend to do that. Um, I think it is an issue. I will say one of the things that um, is, I am 100% confident about is that the students who are going to take AP Biology will not be harmed in the, in the college process because our transcript will make very clear that that was not available for that particular year. So they, are taking, they will be taking the most challenging level of biology that we have available. Any other questions? Just okay. one more. Um, I'd just like to recommend or uh, support you in keeping not making it, um, we will be having it in two years, uh, again next year. We will offer it again next year because might, we might find that it's not appropriate to do AP Biology next year. And, I, and you tell me if I'm wrong that um, I don't think many other the school systems around us do AP Biology. Is that true? Or? Oh, no, quite a few. Okay. Yeah. Quite a few I'm people. sorry. It's, a, it's, it's actually, um, it is, I believe, after. AP English Language and Composition. Okay. I believe it is the most, okay. the second most common AP class that's offered. And sorry, I haven't looked that. at those statistics recently. Then maybe um, you went. I will say about AP Biology that I have promised okay. students right. that, that this one will be returning. I do see the possibility. Sometimes there are schools that do say they schedule in advance so everybody knows we will be teaching this one this year, but not the following year. Yep. That, I think, is more viable, but I think I've made a commitment right now that we will have AP Biology the following year. I know that Mr. Ely, who is sitting here, um, wouldn't mind thinking about, whether, about AP U.S. history because um, he and I agree that one of the issues with all the AP curricula, but particularly the science and social studies curriculum, is they, they are like a freight train yeah, right. in terms of coverage. They, there is just no time to take a breath. Um, and... The College Board keeps saying they are going to re-examine that and re-examine that. I haven't. Supposedly, actually, there are some, some revised in some of the science that's coming out in two years. So I'll be very interested to see that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. So okay. Yes. <sighs> Moving on to new business. Uh, consideration to approve the K-12 through guidance curriculum goals as presented to the board at its meeting on April 13, 2010. Do I have a motion? Move. Thank you, David. Is there a second? A second. Discussion? Um, I, I would just like to thank everyone who was involved in um, presenting to the board um, at its um, April workshop. Uh, I think we had a great report presented to us um, and some interesting discussion following that. Uh, we have some follow-up questions that have been sent to guidance, and I would expect to see those done um, in the next couple of weeks and probably posted on the web. But I thought the team did a remarkable job, and I want to thank Alan for his leadership. I think he did a great job leading the team. And thank so thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor? 7-0. Okay. Consideration to sign the main DOE race to the top memorandum of understanding. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. So moved. So moved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Is there a second? Second. David? A okay. discussion and questions. I think Alan better give us the yeah. David, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Alan. Okay. Fred, Fred, uh, <laughs> whoever, right? Whoever it is. Uh, I, I would speak to it only from this perspective. Is this uh, DOE race to the top? As you know, if you've been reading the newspaper recently and reading some of the announcements about it, has been a fairly uh, 
difficult issue to deal with in this state because we have some already guidelines that are not passed by state legislature that, that make it a difficult decision. Uh, one, one major issue has been evaluation of staff and administration, and it talks about an evaluation that includes data. And there is a committee uh, working on it. They, they are meeting three days before the 15th because they have to get it to the Attorney General by the 15th. Uh, they have met uh, two eight-day sessions, and we're going into a third eight-day session, and I think that's already happened. I have been very concerned about it and initially was going to say I am not going to recommend this to you. However, uh, I met uh, last week with the Cumberland County Superintendents Association and we all discussed this together and what it meant. Uh, we also had a representative from the Department of Education there to talk about it as well. Uh, one of the issues that I had was the fact that it looked like we had to make some commitments on what we would do if it passed. I have, uh, I talked with uh, first of all, Bob Hassan, who is the superintendent at Greeley, who is also on our executive board and is serving on that committee to write the uh, evaluation plans. Uh, he said he was very clear from his information from Sh Sue Gendron before she left that this initial one is only a memorandum of understanding, that we should go ahead with it. Uh, we, talked with, we all talked about it together. Gorham's uh, school board had voted against it at that point in time. They went back and re-looked at it and are going to sign the, the memorandum. On Friday, I spent all day with Drummond Woodson. We had a, a conference with our lawyers. We discussed it again there. Uh, we, uh, again, were told that this is an indication it is not a commitment. Uh, today, when Rebecca was in my office, we, got to, we talked about it again. I called Maine, uh, Maine School Management and said, okay, I need one more look, boys, what is it? They, they said the same thing. It is a memorandum at this point of, a, of, a, of understanding. It is not a memorandum of commitment. Uh, at that point in time, I contacted our new interim uh, commissioner just this, just this afternoon. She called this afternoon. Uh, I do not have it in writing, and I plan to have it in writing so that I, not only I will have it, but because I am president of the Cumberland County Superintendents, I'll make sure we all have it. But the agreement is and the understanding is this, this is a memorandum of understanding that it does not commit us and that we can back out at any time. Now, the other issue there is whether it will even happen. And that is something we don't know. And we won't know uh, until it is submitted in June and then the decision is made. But based on all of those pieces to the puzzle, based on my reading of the document, based on what I'm hearing from the commissioner's office and from my fellow superintendents, I am recommending at this point in time that we do move ahead with a memorandum of agreement, uh, understanding, excuse me. I would offer the opportunity for you in your motion, if you want to change your motion, to be sure it is understood that it is a memorandum of understanding and that does not commit you to a long process if this is passed, that you will relook at it at that point in time. If it's in our minutes, then that stands for protection for us at that point in time as well. I will say, I think I'm fair in saying this, I have talked with Dwight about it. Uh, Dwight certainly has had communication from uh, the MEA, and at this point in time, uh, Dwight and I talked again today, and the, MEA, uh, the Cape Elizabeth Education Association signature will also go on it. Uh, at this point in time with the very same understanding that I'm giving to you at the, uh, as far as this goes. I do have to have this done by the 14th to get into the, yeah, I'm, I see David looking at his watch as I do. Uh, I do have to have it done by the 14th in order to get it to uh, the commissioner's office. Question. Yeah. Conversely, why would we sign it? What, what, what is it? What, is what, what happens at this point in time, it is, a, is a, as you know, is an extremely large amount of money. If we do not sign it now, we will not be able, if we decide we want to get into it, we won't be able to. If we have done this memorandum of understanding, that opens the door for us. But if we haven't signed it now, and it does go through, we will not have the opportunity to participate in it if the money comes through. So that seems to be the, the guiding factor for me as far as at least showing that we want to be included in the discussions if we get it. So if I'm understanding, the bottom line is if we don't sign it, then we won't be receiving money if right. money becomes available. Right. 
Okay, thank and you. And I, I, I think one more piece to go with that, Kathy, just so I'm sure I say this is, if you remember, if, you, if you've been reading about it, 50% of that money goes to Title I schools, and we are not Title I schools in that position, but the other 50% goes to high-performing schools. Uh, for me, that's a really important piece, because yes. all too fr frequently, high-performing schools are not included in this, and so I think that is an important piece of the puzzle. The other side of the coin, if you read it, there is an enormous, enormous amount of work that has to be done if it is accepted. And I think at that point in time, when it, if it is accepted, that that's discussions you as a board will have to have. And to be more than honest with you, it's a discussion I will have to have with you as superintendent because I think we may need to look at, if we do this, a different way of going about this. Thank you. Any other questions? David? Um, I, I accept Alan's, um, I found this stunning when I read it today, overwhelming, uh, bizarre. I will I'll accept Alan's uh, view that we have to sign, some, there is some requirement we sign this. I will have to say carefully that I have read this. Do we have an opinion letter from Drummond Woodson that this is non-binding? When I talked with Drummond Woodson, I do not have an opinion letter. I haven't had time to do that yet, but when I met with them on Friday, I met with their entire law team, and they were very clear that this is non-binding in their discussion with all of us as superintendents on Friday. I, I, I will have to state, because it's my obligation to do so, I have read, not read this thing as carefully as I would if I drafted it, but it does not look non-binding to me. There is a standard phrase that you put in what in is usually a memorandum of understanding or a letter of intent. That phrase is not in here. So I would be, I mean, I just, Tell you about, and I love Drummond Woodsman, I know most of the people there. Lawyers' opinions are worth exactly what the words are in there. They can put enough qualifiers in there to do a variety of things. Letters of opinion are almost not worth much. I, I can just tell you as a, not a legal opinion, because I'm not allowed to do it, I do not see the standard language I see in non-binding letters of intent. Like, this is non-binding and we have the right to terminate in our sole discretion any time we want. I don't see anything like this except agreements to do something. And on that grounds alone, I am, I just have to tell you, I do not believe, and with all due respect, and I have a great deal of respect for Tom Woodson, that this is way too risky for me at this late minute to even think that this thing is non-binding. And, and I think that what you're saying, David, is where I have stood for several weeks. And as a matter of fact, Barbara Powers, who's the superintendent in Falmouth, and I had this discussion. Uh, Barbara, along with several superintendents, had been to a meeting with, the, with uh, Sue Gendron, the Department of Education. Initially, come out with a very different view, and I think kind of the view you have at this point in time. And so that's where I have stood for quite a while. And I've only changed my mind uh, based on what I have heard both from the commissioner's office, from from Drummond and Woodsum, and also from the from the other superintendents who've looked at this, uh, you know. So, so what I, as I told uh, Rebecca today, I am going to continue, and I I know that the uh, Angela will get to me a letter, which commits that this is a new interim superintendent, uh, interim uh, commissioner, uh, about that. And as I said, when uh, Rebecca was with me today, after she left, I sent the letter. I think I sent a copy to all of you, as a matter of fact with a quote from uh, Anita, uh, yeah, just lost her last name, but anyway, from the department. And so I, I am looking for a letter from uh, Angela to, to confirm that information. Can I add two points? I can tell you that a letter from a, um, a green, from a superintendent or anybody is not worth the paper it's printed on because it just isn't as a matter of law. And secondly, there is almost what's called a merger clause in here. It says that this thing can only be amended by written agreement. So if we put something in our minutes that's not in this written agreement, it's not in this written agreement. So you can't modify by minutes. The Drummond Woodson is the one linchpin here that I had that gives me some comfort, but I am very surprised that they're saying that this is non-binding. Any other uh, questions or comments? Um, I have to say um, that I completely share your discomfort, David, 
Um, and I, my, my Can I mind. For the record, you and I agree. <laughs> yes, let's, let's all have a moment. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling feet. Kathy Ray's going to fall over. <laughs> oh. um, yeah. yeah, and I, my, I'm just boggled by this whole thing. I, I, I don't understand how anybody who can read this says that it's not binding. I think the state is scrambling to try to get everything in, in, in order to be able to try to meet this deadline and, and maybe have, will say things that may not truly be accurate. Um, certainly, Attorney General Mills has indicated that what has been done to this point is not sufficient, and she probably will not even sign off on it. That holds a little comfort for me as an elected official for the town of Cape Elizabeth, because, you know, if I, if I were to sign this with the hope that the Attorney General isn't even going to approve the application, um, that's kind of flipping the coin, really. So I, I have, I don't know what to say, Alan. I, I just still feel very uncomfortable. Um, I did not, I did email for the board's um, knowledge, I emailed coalition chair members, because a significant number of them said that they were reviewing the MOU um, within their boards, and I asked, I emailed them today asking them how it went. I heard no response. Um, and I just frankly did not have the time to track it down. Uh, so that's my comment. I think I heard, Seth, Kathy, you raised your hand? Yeah, I, I completely agree with David. Um, first of all, I don't trust anything that the state does. I've seen enough of it over the last seven years to know that they're very fickle and so forth. Um, and with all due respect to superintendents and to, uh, commissioners, um, David's right on. They, what they write is, is nothing. If we had a legal opinion written from Drummond and Woodsum that said it was non-binding, then I would agree. But as it stands now, I'm, and I may be the only one, I'm going to vote against it. But I would like to be very clear. Sure. You, you've heard how hard I have worked on this. I, I, I am have. not <clears throat> sold one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I am just going on the information. Uh, so, you know, from my perspective, as a board, you can vote against this because it is not something that I, I, I feel extremely comfortable with either. Uh, Rebecca and I have had this conversation. My, my goal is just to give you the information that I have at this point as to where we are and what it looks like. And so that's, so you, you as a board can make, it, make your decision not to accept it or can decide to accept it. Could, could I add one more point to make you even more uncomfortable? A signed, <laughs> stop laughing. Um, a legal opinion is a very tricky instrument. It has to be, have absolutely no qualifiers, and I've never seen one and it had no qualifiers. And a legal opinion is only as good. We are signing on to massive obligations here. A legal opinion only gives you a right to damages. We have massive obligations in here that. I'm not sure it could be quantified. So if we had a legal opinion and it was wrong and we were to sue Drummond Woodson, I'm not sure how much of our real damage we could collect. It's, 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 legal opinions are an old school thing that just doesn't do much for me anymore, to be perfectly frank. And Alan, I did want to say I appreciate all the work you did. I mean, it was a tremendous amount of work. You tried to get the information. I, I just don't think we're there. And, uh, you know, your, your point is the trust factor. Mm. I won't say any more than that. No. I could, but I won't. <laughs> no. I won't. Well, the alternative is that if you read this, um, the state recourse for SAU non-performance um, and the enforcement measures that they could take if the SAU does not, does not conform or perform according to these, this memorandum. Um, which include withholding funds, disallowing costs, or terminating this MOU for noncompliance. Well, I mean, if we, just, if we determine that we do not want to participate in the grant because the amount of money that is not, the amount of money that would be provided does not nearly cover the cost of the elements of the plan that they would require of us, mm -hmm. they can keep the money. We don't want it. 
There was, um, there was also another one where that's very astute to you. I won't accuse you of being lawyer-like because you'll find that offensive, but there is another thing where they can require specific performance. Mm -hmm. If it affects the entire state, they can require us to do it. Now, specific performance is an equitable remedy that's not often given, and I'm sure I've, my managing partner is now being, got five phone calls, but it, specific performance would be horrendous. It means you have to do everything it says in here. Mm -hmm. I, I have to tell you right up, right up front, I'm going to vote no. If, if we are allowed to put in a clause, and we can easily get a clause, it's a standard clause. It's not, it's not rocket science that makes this thing non-binding, I would change my mind. But it's not here. But we have to do that by the 14th? Yeah. I, you could get it from the, I could, I could spit, if I was allowed to, I could spit out of my, my mouth right now, but I can't. But you could get it from Drummond Woodson, and you know, it's, it's in every letter of intent you've ever seen for any major project. It's classic language, one paragraph. It's it's three days from now. So we could send it in saying we've complied. And we, by the way, we did what you said. We made it non-binding. Here's the language. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm just saying I, I, my vote would be no unless we got something like that. I understand. That, and that's, that's your threshold for right. voting no. I, I believe that Kathy has indicated that her threshold would be a, a, um, legal, opinion, a legal opinion um, from our attorneys. Um, may I get a sense? Well, I, the, the, no, 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 I'm sorry. We, we have a motion on the table, so let's, let's um, have any further discussion or, or questions, and then we'll call the vote. Well, one question is, when you met on Friday, was that with the superintendents or with... Super, uh, that was, Drummond Woodsum has a yearly get-together okay. of all of us who are su superintendents in the districts they work with. So and so you work. all reviewed this, but, and all the superintendents were able to walk away without um, the letter? I, I mean, it would seem that yeah. our lawyers would be advocating I, I for think, us. I, I would say to you very clearly is we all are struggling with this issue. We're all struggling with the bottom line. I think, and I think David would agree with me, that, that I don't know that Drummond and Woodsum would have written a final letter. I haven't asked them, yep. but I don't know if they would have or not, because I think we, there is what uh, either Kathy or David said earlier, there is a level of distrust that uh, I'm not sure how you get around that, that piece at this point in time. Any other questions or uh, comments? Remember one other thing, that there will be another party to this agreement if I read it correctly. Um, somewhere in here I thought it implied that the federal government, maybe I, I won't, I'll stop, I thought. State. John. I assume that the three days doesn't give us time to negotiate the addition of a clause in, into this agreement, but as you suggest, one thing that we could do is amend the agreement with the clause and sign it um, w with the amendment and send it mm -hmm. amended, and then it's up to the state whether or not to accept our sign, whether or not to accept the, the agreement that we signed and sent to the state. Well, after all, they did say it's non-binding, fine. We're taking what you're we're putting on right. in it. We, we basically, we, we, we put the agreement that we're willing to sign in front of the state and allow them, to, and then they have a decision to make as to whether they want to accept that um, uh, from us or, or reject it from us because it's been amended. Yes. Um, but that way we, um, we uh, protect ourselves in the way that we believe we need to be protected um, without abandoning the opportunity I, I, to be involved in, in any race for the top funds. I, I would, just to cover myself, I would run that by Drummond Woodson, but yeah. that is what I, as an individual non-lawyer, think would be helpful. Okay, any other further questions or comments? Okay. Should we amend the motion then? I, I don't know if we have the legal expertise to amend the motion in such a way that would be non-binding. Ah. Um, my, so what for myself as a board member, um, I will vote no uh, with the hopes that we can get language um, from our attorneys to adjust this memorandum. And I would, I understand that not all of the board members are going to be here Thursday. Um, can I get some, can I sit, find out how many board members are planning on attending the town council workshop on Thursday? Your hands down. Okay, but we have a majority. Um, okay, so perhaps what we can do is agree to meet maybe at seven o'clock, uh, half an hour before the town council meeting, 
um, to review a new memorandum of understanding with the adjusted language to vote on it then? Okay. All right. So that's my, that's my position as a board member. Any other questions or comments? I agree. Okay. I agree with you. All those in favor of the memorandum of understanding? Wait a minute. All those in favor of the memorandum of understanding? Written. As written. Okay. All those opposed? So zero to seven. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next is the um, calendar for 2010-11. Do I have a motion? I move we approve the uh, calendar as presented, the draft calendar as presented for the Cape Elizabeth School Department for 2010-2011. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Linda. Okay. Questions or comments? Uh, Kathy? Um, Alan, I have to um, thank you because this is the first calendar I have seen on my seven years on the board <laughs> that is actually student-centered. Yeah. Um, student-centered. Student it's the least disruptive. It's not full of days here, days there, half days, late starts, early releases, and all the things that, in my opinion, have been very disruptive to the student body. Um, and I'm thrilled to see it, and I just want to thank you and your administrators and the people who worked on the calendar because um, it's terrific. Any other questions or comments? I was just going to make a very similar comment saying that it was really nice to look down and not see all these different colored blocks on every single month <laughs> and trying to, you know, keep the consistency going for the kids, especially, uh, you know, and I, and I really do feel for the families that have kids in the different schools and how much they can be affected by it. So again, my compliments to everybody. Okay. David? Just one quick question, because um, is this the same number of student days as it was last year and it exceeds the state threshold? I, I hate to ask such a basic question, but. This is the same student days, based by state last law, 175. And same, and same state, number of teacher days. And same number as last year? Yep. Okay. The, the only other comment I would make, I think Andrea has sent to you, so you had a chance to look at it. The responses from the public, there were 19 people who responded to it. Um, I think if you looked at it carefully, you see there was, there was kind of comments all over the place. Uh, I think uh, I, was, I was very pleased the number of people who were very satisfied with it. Uh, there were some people who would like to have seen uh, two more days at Thanksgiving time in there, <laughs> including some board members. Uh, there were also some questions about uh, Christmas vacation. Uh, but I think uh, basically what they, with these responses that I read on here anyway, really reflected the responses that we had as an administrative team, and goodness knows we have discussed this calendar over and over and over again as far as where it goes. And my only other commitment is that next year we would do it in September and get it done. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> okay, as much as it pains me not to have a whole week off in November. Uh, are there any uh, questions, comments? Whisper, whisper, whisper. Yeah. We're not able to uh, increase the days. Oh, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I built this based on that what we've been historically done. That would be the discussion. Mary? Mary? Yeah. I mean, Kate, if you want. Dwight would love to. <laughs> Dwight, <laughs> Dwight just about it's, fell over. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no, it's a, it's a good question. I thought of the same thing, but. The problem is we have a contract. He couldn't increase them if yeah, we wanted to. Contracts. That may be something in the future, but not now. Thank you. And, it, and of course, that involves money. Yeah. I forgot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, teachers work for free, right? Okay. Any other okay. questions or comments? We're getting punchy, people. No. Okay. All those in favor? All those in favor? All those opposed? <laughs> Two seven zero. We have a calendar. <laughs> okay. 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 Consideration of superintendent's nominations of the following teachers for the continuing contracts. Um, Alan, do you want to? Just as a quick reminder to all of you that the uh, first two years that a teacher is here, we do probationary. They are probationary, and that they have to be evaluated uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I go to my administrators uh, at the end of each year and I ask them, number one, do you, do you want to have these people come back? And my key question to this is, is, the, is this person worth a million dollars? 
much. The reason for the million dollars is it's once you hire them and go on continuing contract, uh, that money adds up very quickly. So what you see here are the teachers, the probationary teachers that the t uh, principals have told me are the ones that they would nominate for these positions. Uh, do you want me to go down through them or just leave no, it at that? Uh, okay. It's on the agenda, so I believe the public will have access to the name. I would just ask you to make one correction. Under the high school, okay. we do not hire Tatiana Green twice. I was just going to say she's going to I just want I to want be sure that. that we understand that, so I don't have a problem with that later on. Is there a motion? There's a move. No. Is there a motion? Oh, sorry. It needs to I be moved, a little bit more elaborate than what I I move said. that we approve the consideration of the superintendent's nomination of the, of the teachers for team and contracts as set forth in paragraph 7D of our agenda. Thank okay. you. Is there a second? Thank you, Kate. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Consideration of the superintendent's nominations of teachers to second year probationary contracts. Um, I know all five makers the same. Okay. Same issue. Is there a, 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 motion, a motion? I move that we approve the superintendent's nomination of teachers to second year probationary contracts as set forth in paragraph 70 of our agenda of today. Thank you. Second? Second. Mary? Questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, 7G, consideration to approve a leave of absence. Alan. And you have the letter from Susan Deves, who teaches at uh, uh, the middle school. A uh, letter of formal request for a leave of absence for the school year 2010 11. Her husband and she. <laughs> This is okay. I'm expecting our second child not come. We're all getting tired, right? Yeah. It is my wish to stay home with my new baby and my toddler and return to Cape Elizabeth Schools as a teacher the following school year. Thank you for the consideration. Uh, did, this didn't go before Steve, uh, and my understanding is, and Steve may, if Steve wants to comment, my understanding is that you are able to find somebody to, to replace her for that one year. Sue Dees is going to move to the eighth grade for language arts and social studies for next year. She's aware of that. We'll uh, do a one year only. I'm sure the applicant pool will be outstanding for that. Um, although I was very clear with Sue, cut it out. <laughs> Don't do this to me. Come on. So uh, she's, uh, she's just outstanding. And it's going to be difficult to replace her, but the pool will be good. Quick question. Oh. Well, is there a motion? I move that we approve the leave of absence for the 2010-2011 school year for the middle school staff member, Susan Deeds. Is there a second? Okay. Kate, thank you. Question? No question. Uh, Steve, when you replace her, do you replace her with someone with a one-year contract? Just, you don't have to walk all the way up. Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor? Senator, thank you. Okay. All right. Consideration of the following policies for first reading. Uh, Kathy, you're going to uh, speak to this as Linda was not present when these policies were discussed at the policy committee meeting. If you're not, I can. If you can, if you don't feel comfortable, I can do that for you. No, um, there's two policies that the policy committee um, reviewed, uh, JLCA physical exam and JJIAA concussions. Um, there were some changes that some members of the policy committee made, um, and the, this is their first reading, so they're here to be looked at, changes, suggestions, so forth, uh, made. Are you with me, David? Are you done? I'm trying to be, I thought you said concessions, and I got confused. Con I know, concussions. Concessions, concessions, oh, whatever. Concussions. So, um, anyway, just for, for the new board members' um, knowledge, first reading just means it gives public notice to uh, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth that we're making a change to a policy. 
they have a month's time to commute, contact um, either board members or the, uh, the policy committee um, to express any thoughts or concerns. Um, the committee meets again to address any concerns by the public or other board members. Um, so that would be in June, early June. Um, and then in our June business meeting, we would vote to approve these policies. It's called the second reading. So what I would say is that if you have any thoughts or questions about these policies, to please submit them to Linda as chair of the policy committee, and they will be addressed at our next policy committee meeting. Okay? Raising that hand at 10 of 10. Uh, just, are the changes indicated on the, on the policies? Well, actually, there's some significant changes from our current JLC policy, which was just um, revised in June of 2009. So. You should probably refer to the existing policy that's online okay. and compare it with what you have. And policy JJ. IAA is a new policy. There is nothing um, currently in existence in our policy manual. This Thank was you. a draft, um, and I think Jeff Shedd takes most of the credit for creating the document. <laughs> in the blank. Well, no, 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 no. Credit, Jeff, it's credit. Credit for okay. drafting the document. And we thank you for all of your time and work around that. Okay, moving on to the next. So we just read it. You just say it's reading. Yes. Okay. It's just a reading. Um, and you're on the policy committee, so you can let yourself know if you have any questions or concerns about <laughs> He's not on the policy. He's not on the policy. I don't have any questions. I've already read. <laughs> no, some of my suggestions are already no, in there. Exactly. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to include some humor. Okay, consideration of the following job descriptions, Director of Community Services um, and the Fitness Center Attendant Trainer. Um, yes, uh, the Human Resources Committee would like to recommend for approval the two job descriptions, one for Community Services Director and the other for the Fitness Center Attendant and Trainer. Is that your motion? As presented. Excellent. Is there a second? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Comments, questions? Yes, I, I have Hold one. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to let somebody else ask another question, if, if, there, if there is any. Okay, go ahead, Dave. I, I have a change. When I, we were doing this, I blanked out on the word I wanted to add, and it came to me. I left it with its, um, and the office, and, and so I, I would just, I'll read it to you, and I. Which, which one? It's the uh, attendant trainer. It's on the performance responsibilities, paragraph four, yep. uh, where we struck ensure that I would add in the word reasonably maintain. Okay. And after the words in bold, so that they are, I would stick in the word again, reasonably. Just so you know, the reason is to make this the standard negligence standard rather than a higher standard. Okay. Not that you would know because you're not an attorney, but okay. No, 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 no legal opinion here. <laughs> okay. Thank you for, uh, is that acceptable uh, changes? I Linda? don't see any problem. Nope. Okay. Done with it. <laughs> okay. And I'm just, there was a second. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Seven zero. Subject to the changes. Subject to the changes, correct. Okay. Um, the school budget vote. This is language that we are required to pass per state legislation. Um, and it's related to the forms that nearly all of you signed. I have two signatures. I haven't signed it. Oh, you have um, okay. We just need a majority technically. Well, I, I would like to have everybody sign it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, Pursuant to 20 A R M R S A 1486 2 and 2307. I don't know how to read this. The form of notice of amounts adopted at town council meeting. Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. I, I, Kathy, I believe that you as finance chair should be reading this. 
Okay, what is it? <laughs> Lots of ink. Uh, let me this, is the, this is to pass what we all just signed, I believe, correct, Pauline? This language is so we can post what we just pat, what we just signed. Yes. Oh, this is for the breakdown of the budget? Yeah. This, this is for the breakdown of the budget, Pauline? By category for the state. Okay. There we go. Now we all understand what we're talking about. We don't. Okay. <laughs> that purse went to 20A MRSA 1486-2 and 2307. The form of notice of amounts adopted at town council meeting be approved. And that the superintendent of schools be authorized and directed to complete said notice in accordance with the meeting at which the school budget is approved. And to cause said notice as completed to be delivered to the town clerk for display at all polling places for the school budget validation referendum to be held following the meeting at which the town council approves the school budget. Is there a second? Second. Could I see that for a second? Okay, John, you have a question? Yeah, the, the summary of total authorized expenditures is 19751000 and so forth. Only that's, that excludes the A. RRA funds? Yes. yes. Yes, because it's not. It requires the approval of local funds general fund budget only. Not including the federal funds. But including the state funds. Okay. Uh, I'm a bit confused by this vote. It says that the pursuant to those statutory sections, a form of notice amounts adopt, adopted past tense at town council meeting be approved. It sounds like the notice we send out after. Um, we are voting on this because we will not be meeting in a business. We, we, this needs to be ready to go when the town council votes on it. We will not be meeting in it. We will not be having a business meeting before it needs to be posted. Okay, can I make a suggestion, amendment that we, uh, uh, that we Hold that in escrow until the town council votes, and then it's. it's I, mean, I do it if you want. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. All right. Now, you people. This it's the third time that we've gotten to this place. Can um, I move that we adjourn? No. Um, where the committees were, the people were supposed to be reporting on our progress towards the goals. What I'm going to suggest we do is delay this one more meeting, but that we move it up. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to move it up to um, communications. Not the end of the meeting because honestly this is one of the most important parts of the work that we do as a board. We all agreed that it was important. We spent a great deal of time in setting those goals and we have yet to check in on them. So um, I'm going to recommend that we skip committee reports unless I hear from otherwise from board members. Okay. Public comment on non-agenda items. And, uh, school board agenda requests. I believe um, that you've uh, asked that we talk about the middle school athletics, and uh, we will talk about that in our agenda meeting Fine. for next. Presentation. It wasn't a big item. Okay. Announcement of upcoming meetings. They are post. Uh, uh, agenda request. Why don't you email me what you'd like to have discussed? Thank you. Okay. Um, Dates to remember, uh, they are posted on the website. Um, I will note once again that the school board workshop set on. Um, is currently on May 25th, but that has been postponed to June 1st. Um, although we will be calling now a special business meeting for this coming Thursday at 7 o'clock, and I'm yep. hoping we can get the Jordan Conference Room. Um, can you say that again? What date? This Thursday. I don't know oh, the date. 7 o'clock? Yes, okay. we have to Third vote time. on the memorandum of understanding if if if, if we can amend okay. it. Okay, adjournment. Is there a motion? So, so moved. moved. <laughs> who you'd like? Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Mary. Nothing. I was ready. You better leave it on the adjournment.